Yes, it's true on a gram per gram basis, animal protein is better. That being said, if you do use a plant protein powder, try to get ones that have multiple sources of plant proteins. They tend to be complementary. In other words, uh, some have some higher amounts of certain amino acids, lower amounts of other amino acids, and combining them with other plant proteins tends to fill the gap. So uh, at the end of the day, if you get a protein powder that's plant-based, make sure it has multiple sources of plant proteins. It's probably going to be better for gains. This, this all, of course, is negated if your protein intake is just super high, right? So if you're eating a lot of protein, then the sources don't make a difference. But for most people who are not eating the, you know, 0.8 to 1 gram of protein per pound of body weight, then the protein type uh, makes a difference. And uh, again, with plant proteins, you'll find like some plant proteins are too low in, let's say, leucine or isoleucine or another amino acid. Mm -hmm. And then you complement it with other plant proteins that are higher in those, but lower in others. So they tend to be, uh, you know, they tend to complement each other. Do you know what the most popular vegan protein is, like source is in terms of if they're going to go one source, is it pea or is it? It is now. Yeah. Yeah. Pea protein by itself, if you're to, com you has know, that compare. Changed? That's changed over time? It has, right? So yeah. if you're going to compare singular sources of plant proteins, pea protein is uh, probably the, one of the better ones. It used to be soy. Mm -hmm. Soy used to be the one that the go to, and then soy got a bad rap because of the potential yeah, xenoestrogen, yeah. you know, type deal, which was overblown. Um, I sure. think in many cases, I think if you just had soy all the time and that's all you had, then maybe. Um, but um, and fermented soy seems to not have the same effect that they find with the other types. But yeah, but yeah, it was like brown rice protein and pea protein seem to be the the. The, the most common now one. it's like it, they're adding is it from algae there was another source that they're getting protein for is that like uh for i, I the, haven't seen that okay i um, haven't seen that okay yeah I, I think um and then the other thing is taste because uh like whey is uh pretty neutral so you can have like chocolate vanilla strawberry plant proteins aren't so neutral like pea protein is tough like pea yeah. protein chocolate Tastes kind of like I'm not a fan. You, it's, like you mowed the lawn. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And a bit of shaving. <laughs> yeah. I, so yeah. when I when I eat like so when I use the Organifi vegan protein powder, I make my fruity shakes. Yeah. So I th I find that like the berry, like strawberries, blueberries, bananas tend to that the kind of tarty flavors mix better with yeah. vegan proteins. And then I think like if I want something more savory, like if I do like you know if I use any sort of chocolate or peanut butter or something like that. Then, Those, like whey. then I like whey. Or if yeah. I just want it like straight, like his whey, straight vanilla or chocolate whey to me tastes really good. It's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, but that being said, uh, I mean, this was, a, this was, I mean, we've been orga with Organifi for, how long have we been with them now? Six years? Five yeah, years? Six, yes. no, six, seven years. Six seven, or seven yeah, years? Seven okay. Long time. One of the selling points, because um, there's a whole long process when we work with a company, we have to take the products, like the products, meet the people, like the people, Look at their business. You know, this is like we don't just work with anybody. But one of the selling points was their their protein is vegan, and it actually, I mean, compared to other vegan proteins, tastes good. Yeah, I have not had a vegan protein that tastes anywhere near good like theirs, and I've had a lot because I can't do whey, I can't do the dairy based ones, and vegan pro. And you guys know me; I'll take it if it's a supplement, whatever, I'll take it. But I still, it's not like I can't taste it. Vegan proteins are terrible, disgusting, yeah. typically. And theirs isn't bad, but they use a mix. So if you look at the types of, of proteins, the plants that they use, they use a blend. And a blend is better because they tend to complement each other. Like, so when you're a vegan, if you're going a whole food based vegan, which is the best type of uh, a vegan diet, it's whole food based, just like it's the best type of omnivore diet, right? Whole food based. The challenge though is that vegans have to be more careful with how they combine their foods and where they get their nutrients because- Vegan sources of nutrients sometimes aren't as easily absorbed or harder to find. Like vitamin D, vegan sources of vitamin D don't absorb as well as like, let's say like vitamin D you get from animal sources or the B vitamins, stuff like that. So you want to combine and source and just be more careful. And then proteins, you want to combine protein sources. Like with animal sources, I could have just all beef or all chicken or mm -hmm. all dairy, and I'm going to get good uh, quality protein. 
with uh, vegan sources that you typically want to mix them together to get that. So it, you know, that holds true for protein powders too. If you're getting a vegan source of protein powder, look at the back. And if it's just like brown rice protein or just pea protein or just, you, you, you probably want to go with one that has, you know, three, four, five different sources so that you can get a better amino acid profile. And again, this doesn't matter if you eat a ton of protein. If you're eating a gram of protein per pound of body weight, yeah. then it really doesn't make that. It doesn't make a difference. You're getting plenty of all the amino acids, but most people don't do that. Most people don't hit those. Numbers. Yeah. I, fi I find this whole conversation overblown. I really do. I, th I find that like we get into this, this, the all the nuances of the different types of uh, protein powders and and making the cases of what's what's worthless, what's more, what's better for this, what's better. It's like at the end of the day, the advice is really easy. It's like do your best to get all of your protein, whether you're a vegan or an omnivore, get all of your protein sources from whole natural foods. If and only if you can't do that or you struggle in that day, use a protein powder. And, and hit those high targets. Yeah. yeah. And hit those high targets. Exactly. Hit this, your hit your hit your macros. Hit your macros. Do it through whole foods, whether you're a vegan or omnivore, doesn't matter. Do your best to get it through whole foods. And if you don't, that's where you utilize your shake. Get the best get the best quality shake that you can and, and then that you enjoy and that you'll actually use. So have you guys ever have you guys had because I've had a few clients like this, not a ton, but I've had a few clients that just they just they refuse. They just couldn't get anywhere near the high protein targets that are optimal. Like mm -hmm. and not even halfway there. It was just low. Like I had a guy I had a guy that I worked with who he was vegan. He didn't want to supplement with protein powders that much or whatever. And this, this, he was a 180 pound dude and he was getting like 65, 70 grams a day. And he didn't, he didn't want to just, we just couldn't change it. We couldn't. So I had him add a little bit of protein powder or I'd have him add branched amino acids. Huge difference. Because his protein yeah. was so low. Right. Huge difference in his performance and recovery and strength. It like to the point where well, he was like, what are you giving me? This is making, yeah. I had a, a client difference. like that that was vegan and, and was trying really hard to get it from natural sources and from uh, all the vegetables and fruit and everything else. And uh, it was just like almost impossible to get, you know, the daily standard for protein. And so to convince him to, to, um, supplement with protein powder was like a big step but then it was like it made a humongous Huge. difference otherwise it's like yeah it was it was man like the amount of volume uh in order to get the protein levels up was insane well if you're man or woman and you're only eating on a regular day 60 to 90 grams of protein and i give you a 30 40 gram protein shake you're yeah. talking about game changer yeah you're increasing your protein intake by a third i mean that's a huge that's a significant difference i think that's actually part of what perpetuates this whole argument about how all the the superiority of certain protein powders and why they're so amazing why people think they're considered like a health food themselves yeah. is because i'm sure many people who don't really try Track, pay attention to they fall in that category they fall in that category where all of a sudden they start taking a shake and wow they're building muscle and they yeah. weren't building muscle before and it's like well yeah you were there's a deficit there yeah right. there's a massive deficit there and then all of a sudden you give it a little bit in the right direction and your body responds to you i mean i'm, I'm this way right so when i when i'm inconsistent with my training and diet um I just naturally gravitate to more starchy carb type foods. And in, even though I love meat, like eating two or three meals with a eight ounce piece of meat is still not enough protein for me. Three meals, eight ounces, eight ounces of meat. You're talking about maybe 35 grams per mm -hmm. meal times three. I mean, that's 105 grams. I'm a 230 pound yeah. dude. Yeah. That's not enough for me. So, and that's, and that's, that would be a good day. All meals have a balanced eight ounce piece of meat. There might be a day where I skipped one of those meals, only two meals. Yep. And I, and, and even if I went 12 ounce and 12 ounce, I'm still significantly under. So I, I mean, and then, so if I were to add a protein shake in there, I would feel and see a significant this is, difference. This is true for all essential uh, nutrients, by the way. I had this conversation with my son. I'm like, you need to drink more water. He's like, well, I drink when I'm thirsty, so I'm fine. I said, okay, there's a difference between what is essential. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to die. Right. Okay. But then there's the also minimum, but then there's optimal right. yeah. the difference. There's a gap between essential and optimal and all nutrients are like this. There's essential, there's optimal. And then there's also a lot of people also don't even get essential. Yeah. Then there's deficient. Yeah. So like all nutrients, zinc, vitamin D, magnesium, vitamin C, and then you can consider proteins and fats there. Those are essential. Sometimes people are below even what's essential. Then they supplement 
And it's like you gave them a magic drug. I've had clients like this where yeah. we do, we do, we're trying to figure out what's going on, why they feel a certain way, whatever. And then we do some tests like, oh, your zinc is low. They supplement with zinc and it's like so life changing yeah. to them that they become evangelists for zinc. They tell everybody to, tell zinc, to take zinc. And I'm like, listen, if you're low in zinc, it makes this difference. Yeah. Taking more than you need isn't going to do anything. Yeah. So with people with protein, it's like, you ask the average person, do you eat enough protein? They'll be like, yeah. Go, oh, really? What do you eat for breakfast? Well, I have two eggs, so there's protein. What do you have for? Yeah. Oh, like I have like deli a deli meat, deli those, sandwich. Yeah, yeah, and oh, well, what about dinner? Oh, I have a yeah, chicken salad. Anything. Yeah, you do the math. You're like, you had 70 grams. Yeah, yeah. You had 70 grams it's of protein. That, yeah. yeah, and some women, I would have 40. Yeah. 40 in a day. And I'm like, no, no, no. B trust me. If we just add one shake, like one scoop, yeah. it's going to be a mind blowing. And then, of course, they become evangelists for protein, thinking that it's magic. It's like, no, you were eating way too low. All right, today's program giveaway, MAPS Anabolic Advanced. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section that you want access to MAPS Anabolic. Also, we got a sale going on right now in two programs. MAPS Anabolic, the original, and MAPS Split. Both 50% off. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Anyway, speaking of your consistency, Adam. Yeah. This is terrible. This is I, uh, fuck off. I dude. saw you. I already, was, I already know. Where you I went. saw yeah. you uh, walking funny. You know what's you know what's crazy? What I was thinking about. What's going actually, on, dude? I fucking hurt myself. <laughs> this is so stupid. <laughs> why you hurt yourself all the time? Why does Sal always enjoy? I don't enjoy. He does. Yourself. He does. He's just, just when you thought you were gonna catch me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't That's what that no, is. no. <laughs> I hate it when you get hurt. I hate it. I don't like it. I don't want you to get hurt. Uh, but please, it's a dude. boy. What an opportunity to, have to make well, money. Well, first of all, it's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Remember, I, I talked a long time ago on the show that I when we start, we were talking on one of our episodes and we were talking about the importance of water and I and I said, um, you know, I, I connected a, a long time ago that if I was dehydrated, I would always pull this quad muscle. It's always the same one. Same one, same so one. Cool. And it'd always be when I'm doing like real heavy squats when I have to explode out of the hole or something. And it, it feels like it, it pops or it pulls. And then I'm pretty much down and out on my leg for about a week or so. And normally the day after or whatever, or two days after I got a little bit of a limp from it. It's not, a, I know it's not a major tear because it heals and it's, but it's the same thing. And I always notice it. And it's always been connected to this dehydration. So yesterday, it's, uh, Easter and stuff, Easter Sunday, we're, we're, we decide we're going to play some family wiffle ball, which sounds great. Problem is, okay, I was doing the brisket all day. I skipped meals. And all I, the only calories I consumed was alcohol. Hard alcohol and beer is all I've been consuming all afternoon. And it's the hottest day we've had all year. So I'm out in the sun, no, no water, nothing but alcohol. And it was nothing. I mean, I literally, the ball was hit by direction and I like moved to the, moved like, ex like slightly explosive, not even like real explosively, oh, like no, kind of, just a little fast. Oh, and it was some, oh, some yeah. haste. And, but yeah, I played it off though. Like they didn't know, like I didn't make a big deal. You're about the fit it. guy too. Yeah, totally. Cause I'm so I don't <laughs> want to, I'm like, oh, I'm out already. We just started. And I'm like, so I like played the rest Overweight of the game. Overweight family members are like yeah. jumping. Totally, running. totally oh, like that. that so sucks. But yeah, uh, you know, you know, it's you know what alcohol too. What it also does because it, it's a it it dehydrates you. Well, no. Besides that, it reduces inhibition. Uh, so you're also less. Your body's also less inhibited to prevent you yeah. from doing shit. Because I've I worked out one one time in my life. I worked out a little drunk. Yeah, and I pulled a lap muscle. And I know why it's because my body's like the, the, the governors are a little off. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No. And I, and you know, what's funny was I even kind of felt it. I was telling Katrina, like I could feel like my, my neck was like tense. Like my mm. leg, it just didn't feel right. And I still, still played anyways. And I just thought in my head, like, oh, I just won't go hard, but just that little bit of a movement. Oh, and sucks. I did that. And you know what really sucks? And I'm, and I'm glad I had good momentum going into this because this is to me how this is a classic example of how one falls off. Right. Great rhythm right now. Have a stupid little injury like that. Not crazy. It probably sent me back a week, but here we go. We go. Then I, I roll into a holiday weekend. So there's drinking and, and maybe poor food choices. Then what do we go in two days? Two days, we get on a plane, yeah. we fly out of state yeah. for three three or four days. And, the, and, I, and now I'm also nursing an injury. And it's like, man, this is real 
This is like right when those those moments tend to happen. What a wonderful opportunity because mm -hmm. I'm probably going to work out while we're over there. So you're gonna, I'm sure you're going to join me then and do some exercise. Oh, I'm definitely not stopping. Like I'm, yeah! I'm training today. That means you have to come too, Justin. I'm just going to have to back off my. Yeah. Just can't my, sleep in, bro. I'll film you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again? Yeah, yeah. 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 I'll just back just off the of legs for like a week, a week or so. Which I mean, I'm. It's w here's the thing. I was, I was due. I was so on like a, leg extension, leg curls, if you can. And that's yeah, it. actually, leg extension would hurt worse. That's right where it's right. Oh, really? Yeah, so that would hurt more. Oh, like, is it on the inner? Yeah, it's like just barely. You know, it's really, it's a What's really that muscle call. Is that gracilis? I don't know. You're good at massaging that one out. No, so. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You guys you're share a room. For that. <laughs> Doug and I share a room. You guys yeah. share a room every yeah. time. Yeah. So you'll be helping. Justin has Justin's hands are chapped though. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, it doesn't very feel, dry. Yeah, it doesn't feel the same as yours and Doug's. Guy. Oh, yeah. you know, Doug has the smoothest hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have magic fingers. Scratch hands. Damn, damn, that sucks, dude. Yeah, duh. But you know, like I said, I was. It's not a major injury. So it's not. It's not a major. I felt it. I was enough to like kind of back off. And so I am limping around today and yesterday and I probably will be till tomorrow. But it, it takes, and I've been here before, it takes about a week mm. to start feeling where I can start training where leg extension stuff will happen. So you know what's weird about this? This is a good discussion um, because everybody's experienced this where you have this one area that you, if you're going to get hurt, you tend to get hurt here. And I'm yeah. not talking about like, a, like I understand when you have a joint problem and then the, the joint itself has some you know mechanical issues or there's some tissue there that's not like you have a slightly torn meniscus mm. or you dislocate your shoulder a bunch of times so there's uh, you know the, the groove that holds in the humerus is off or whatever i'm not talking about that i'm talking about like a, a, the same muscle like i have in my up like in my mid back right in the thoracic area on my left side if I hurt my upper mid back and I there's an area I'll pop and it's the same damn place. Yeah. So I have a theory around. Do you guys do you have anything well, like that? Well, I have the same in my QL on the left side. Okay. And it always just aggravates me. Okay, so here's my here's my thoughts because I, I get it if there's like a structural issue, so that'll tend to keep keep getting re-injured. I get that. And it doesn't go away. I understand that. But you'll hear about this with like a muscle, which should be totally fine. So what I think that happens is I think that there's there's a physiological thing that happens when you get hurt. Muscle pulls, inflammation, it heals, muscles healed. No, Physiologically, we cannot now look and see if there's anything wrong with it. We could look at it, we could examine it, biopsy it, totally fine. And yet, same muscle will get hurt again another time. I think there's also a psychological injury, a psychological um, uh, you know, memory of that injury, and you move ever slow, slightly different, then on out, unless you fix that psychological, whatever it is, that's my theory, because why would that same muscle over and over and over? In other words, you create some kind of yeah. a pattern and even though the muscle gets better, triggers the same governing response. That's oh, I think there's something there. I right? think, I think, I, I mean, don't think it's all physiological. I mean, I, I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't argue that either sure because I do, I definitely think it's all connected like that. Although I think that it's more so like an overcompensation. Like, so what I know about my left side, if, if I were to like get in, like you can't see this and the average person can't see this. I can see it. it's my body and I know and I can feel and see this. I have this real slight, like if I go into a deep, heavy squat, my left foot will just barely right. move out to the left. Right. So I know I get a little bit of overcompensation on this on this left side. So when I when I uh, the little I have a little bit of an imbalance when I do that. Even with all the work I put in stuff like that, it's just it's just an, always it's uh, this is my area. Of this so and then I've been training heavy and hard lately with with squats and deads mm -hmm. and everything right now. And so I think that I've just been overcompensating on this side more than anything. And then I go and do something that i'm completely not trained for i have not trained any reactive explosive type of movement yeah, plus the combined plus with the alcohol, hydration yep. out and, yeah. and so it's just the recipe for right. guarantee that's going you so know? so so with that it, i think that in in some cases not all cases that there is not a structural or physiological reason for that compensation but rather psychological in other words mm. you have a memory of that injury and unconscious subconscious part of it's conscious part of it's subconscious that maybe that injury always bothers you, always stops you in your tracks. Maybe it stopped you from doing something that was really awesome for you, or you've just had it so many times that you've created this CNS memory mm. that now creates this pattern. And until that gets fixed, you're never truly healed. Because you see this so often with people with these strange reoccurring injuries. So yeah, I think there is a movement pattern yeah. that's happening that's, that's slightly different. 
but it may not be because of anything structural well, or physiological. Yeah, you know, rather I'm, psychological. I've been going through lately is um, my feet have been really bothering me in terms of like um, doing activities like that where I'm moving super fast or whatever. Like, because I always, I converted at one point to shoes that were flat and like don't give you any support and like are flexible on mm. some level because it's like I want to be able to move and function my toes and be able to ground. And uh, like when I was snowboarding, my boots just, I, the first thing that would fatigue on me and my feet would just burn up and I had to like sit out in, in a few runs and I'm like, well, dude, why am I such a bitch? Like, yeah. why, why, are my, <laughs> why are my feet just not working You're for so me mean anymore? Yourself, yeah. just. <laughs> and it was just so frustrating. And then like the same thing. So I just, over the weekend took, um, Ethan and his friends, it was like eight of his friends. We went paintballing and with Everett and uh, I was wearing these old shoes because you want to wear all old clothes. You're yeah, it's destroyed. Yeah. You know, and so I'm wearing these shoes that were like paper thin and I'm running and, you know, shooting kids, which is really fun. Let me tell you, it's like, <laughs> it should be illegal. But like, you <laughs> we're know, just dominating just, yeah, that. It was like two adults and like, we're just like destroying all these kids, you know, <laughs> it felt wrong. It really did, but it was fun. But good at the but same time. But it was time. good. It, it was, yeah, it definitely filled some weird psychotic, you know, need that I had. Um, <laughs> and uh, so my feet were just on fire again and I'm like, oh my God, my feet are just killing me. Uh, so I'm like, I might actually start if I'm like running faster, accelerating, I might start actually wearing shoes now, look into ones with more support. Uh, New Balance, I heard, makes it good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I finally need to convert to the dad shoe. Yeah. This is what I'm getting at. Yeah. <laughs> that sucks. Yeah. Hey, the comfortable. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. I'm Some here, grass stains on it. You're good Damn to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's, it's an interesting conversation. I, I, I had, I've had clients before. I definitely, had, I 100% get behind that theory for sure with some stuff. I definitely think. Yeah, that not all, right? Yeah, yeah. But I, I mean, like talk to, I guarantee, I know Katrina's told you this, where a massage therapist, a really good one, will work on someone, they'll find a knot or whatever you want to call it, right? Where they're tight, they'll press on it and then the person will get an emotion. They'll cry. Oh, well, oh, yeah. they- Or they'll laugh they or something have strange. Store emotion. They, yes. Yeah. yeah, no, if you want to, I mean, you want to be entertained with that stuff the last, the, like we talked about the last time, you can ask her, different parts of your body represents different, like one part represents finances, one is the female side, yeah. one is the oh. male side. So she'll rub, she'll rub me and if she feels ten, tension on one side or the other, she will, she'll question me like that. She'll go like, who are you getting in an argument with that's a male so or who, who, have, yeah, who have you been like, she'll, she'll be questioning me like that as she's rubbing me. So if you really want to get tripped out by that type hey, of so stuff. When you, when you, when you, she's trying to get you to like get out of lie or something. Yeah, of like course. That. Yeah. That's hey, why so what were you I doing take the fifth night? on everything, bro. Yeah. I'm like, I'm, just rub me. I'm not fucking answering yeah. anything. Oh, I didn't do anything. <laughs> just honey. just, uh, you just fix it. Just fix me. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so, I mean, they've said what, like in, fa in the fascia is, is responsible for holding some, but also too, like I was just watching the show. I think it was it's human the what lies beneath or something on Netflix and and they're talking about the amygdala and how like basically the amygdala like also like carries a lot of this emotion uh you know through the nervous system uh based on like how you respond uh really fascinating show though they had like one um new breakthrough technology where the guy had like uh, missing an arm and this uh, I guess these researchers found that um, you could you could basically put a sensor to connect to the existing nerves that that used to be responsible for the hand that mm -hmm. gives you that phantom limb kind yeah. of sensation. They're able to connect to that, and so so basically, like the the hand that they gave him um, had sensation. He could feel. He could actually yeah. feel yeah. like how hard to to clasp it not just open close and the function of it but also like the touch you of can it feel it yeah yeah so that's what i'm trying to say you can't here's the 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 problem is we try to separate the the brain and the mind from the body you can't it's yeah. an extension yeah phantom limb syndrome is a perfect example for people who aren't familiar with that it's like somebody will lose an arm and they literally feel like they still have an arm. It's just in tremendous pain. Yeah. And there's nothing you could do about it. Painkillers, nothing you could do about it. Somebody invented something called a mirror box, which is a uh, actually solves a lot of these issues. But you can't separate them. So I, I you know, I Jessica had a shoulder when I first met her. She had injured her shoulder doing the the silks. So that's where she learned how to do that when she used to travel with uh, the circus. And it was a life-changing uh, physical experience for her. It taught her she could, she was athletic. She could be physical. She'd never done anything like that before. Built lots of confidence. She was ex exceptional at it. Loved it. Overdid it. Hurt her shoulder. Couldn't do it anymore for a while. 
So she probably had developed some kind of, you know, trauma from it. Like, fuck, I can't do this thing anymore. Shoulder bothered her. She meets me. We do all this correctional exercise over and I'm doing this stuff with her. I'm like, you've got great shoulder function. Everything is working fine. This is very strange. And I suggested this to her at one point. And uh, I remember she was like thinking about it, working on it. And then it went away, like literally disappeared. Like it just went away. And I remember her texting me like, the pain is gone. And it's because I thought about the fact that maybe it was related to the psychological aspect of it or whatever. So I, you know, I think, and by the way, Mm -hmm. they've done this with, uh, with therapy where people have back pain or neck pain or people with sexual trauma will have pain and then they'll go through therapy and the pain will go away. Yeah. yeah. So this is what that percentage looks like, you know, an average of like how much of it's psychological versus physiological. It's gotta be a massive spectrum. Yeah. Yeah, It's gotta be a massive spectrum. You gotta be somebody who's like, I mean, I, I imagine somebody who has more like a hypochondriac, right? Like they're, Probably and they more are sensitive, more sensitive, right? They get more in their head on the psychological side. Somebody who's not, it's probably the other side, and there's probably everything yeah. in the middle. I of think that. it's not yeah. a black or white. I think it's Definitely everybody. Can, yeah, but to but more on some, just like you said, yeah, uh, yeah. more on the other. No, so no. I don't know, man. No. <laughs> but hey, sorry, you hurt yourself. Yeah, no, I mean it's again, <laughs> not it's, rubbing your leg. I think uh, I think I think I'll be all right. But I, what made me really frustrated was thinking about wow, like the timing of going into a weekend of Easter and then a week where we travel. You know, what I'm saying it's like, man. That's really what sets you up for these like setbacks. Like I'm right on, right in a nice rhythm right now. It's a perfect storm. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. and I, I really think that this, these are the most important times to, which is how I'll approach this week. Is like, man, if I thought I was good last week or the week before, I'm gonna dial in even tighter this week because oh, I good because I know I have yeah. a challenge, and it's like I know it'll get easier on the other side if I once I get. If past you can it. stay consistent yeah. during the hardship, then yeah, the what one hundred percent. That's why I always like that. That oh, that's where I I had that hack that I shared where. When I began looking at weekends as like win the weekend, and then it always set the tone for my week. Because the weeks were easy. Yeah, weeks yeah. are easy. I'm in a routine. I get up at a certain time. I work certain hours. Yeah. It's like, those are my most routine days. It's weekends that are always different and up in the air. And so if I could win the weekend, it always set the, yeah. the tone for the week. You mentioned Easter. How'd you guys' Easter, by the way? <laughs> it was, was good, it? dude. Now, yeah. you you hosted. I did, and I did my first brisket. Okay, so the, you sent pictures. Yeah. It, it, was it as good as it looked? Because it looked incredible. Yeah, the family liked it. I, I'm, I'm pretty... I'm, I think Doug and I are like this where I'm, I'm pretty hard on myself when it comes to like, I have high standards for my, 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 you my, did the whole deal, like hours and hours and yeah, hours 18, of- eight, almost 18 hours, right? Total. Well, no, it was like 13, 14, 15. Well, you like had to 15. wake up at 5am? No, I did the you whole did day, the day before. before oh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I started, I started at 11, 11 PM the day before I got up at 4 a.m. to check it, got up at 6 a.m. again oh to check God. it and then, and then, uh, transitioned it at 8 a, at 8 a.m finished it by like about noon and then we served it at like two. Oh my um, god this whole time so what yeah. you, so what is what's going on the whole time it's just slowly cooking and yeah smoking. it's a slow so you, it's a slow smoke right and it was my first time so that was the only reason why i was getting up i was just nervous like you leave something on the grill overnight i'm like what if i run out of pellets what if yeah. it gets down so cold that it, it cools the temp down and then now i got it like so yeah, you know, I was a little nervous. I didn't need to. I technically could have set it and left it, and just let. And that's how I'll do it next time. I'll just let let it be, right? Um, so I was checking it a lot just to make sure everything was good. Because I mean, I was, you know, talking to Doug. I'm like, he's like, man, that's pretty ambitious to be hosting a party of twenty people in your first brisket. Like, yeah. I mean, everybody's counting on that being the main because dish. Brisket, <laughs> you either do it right or it's gross. Oh yeah, you I've can, never had it in the middle. You can, yeah, you could really, yeah. you could really screw it up. And I don't think I did it all. The things that I found that were most challenging is that it was a big sixteen pounder. It's huge, right? And I have had the literally half of it was this big fatty piece. And then it like thinned out the other half of it. And so, you know, you want to take the temperature on the fattest part because you or you don't want to take it on the thin part and then pull it. And then this thing's raw. Because oh, right, you, right, right. So you want the thickest part for sure cooked to the right temperature. So I pulled it at about 195, 200 degrees, which is where you want to pull it. Um, and that was just that half was epic. I mean, like when I cut it, it's like off when you see it on like the shows. Was it like when we went when we go to Texas? When yeah, we went to Texas? I, you know, I don't want to say I'm like at Franklin's or at Law Barbecue level yet, bro. That's like my first brisket. So, but I mean, it was it was it was better than anything we got over here. Oh, good. I'll tell you right now, oh, like yeah. yeah, it was better than any brisket you buy over here. It wasn't quite Texas, you know, but. Yeah, you go to put the knife in, and just as soon as I put the knife in, the juices squeeze out the uh, middle. So it was it was good, but there's things that I would have already, I'd go and do different. But it was a it was a cool, cool little experience. Yeah, twenty people. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a big party. Yeah, it's Katrina's family. You know what I'm saying whenever we have her family, it's always a dude. I was telling these guys, 
fucking we have two kids right max and then my cousin daniel jerry's daughter yeah, yeah. are the only two kids young enough to do yeah. eggs anymore all yeah. the rest of us are all adults and so because there's way more adults than there are kids hunting eggs and every adult brings an easter basket for mask brings toys for him does the eggs we had, a, we had 130 eggs <laughs> <laughs> for two kids for two kids wow. <laughs> max had max had two had to do two easter baskets it <laughs> filled up this whole bucket and then busy. he didn't <laughs> he didn't, he didn't get through opening half of them he was already bored oh, that's hilarious oh, wow. it's overkill dude that's it's too much man and so it's a weird i was talking to my aunt and uncle who who uh grew up themselves incredibly conservative raised their kids really conservative um lived off of one income and just we were we were talking about like the the pitfalls of just getting so much at such a young age and it's like such a hard thing for me because i mean i literally can count on one hand mm -hmm. including clothes okay including clothes shoes and toys how many things i've bought my son i've bought my son less than five things and because everybody else because everybody else just buys so much stuff for him he literally got maybe that's going to be his, his challenge when he grows up uh, for, everybody bought me stuff but my dad for sure oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my, <laughs> my dad so backfired my, my, my dad, dad never just, got me anything my dad never yeah. got me anything <laughs> why did everybody oh god me? don't say that so <laughs> so gonna be you're gonna buy something now right, right. Uh, yeah. Right. So just, <laughs> yeah so it's really hard and then, and then and then i'm always in this predicament of like i know that's not an ideal situation right i know it's not ideal but then who do i deprive that of what aunt doesn't get to, to, yeah, to do yeah. it? What grandma doesn't get to do it? Like what, who, who gets screwed in that situation? Like has, having, getting some stuff from these guys is yeah. okay. But it's like when every family member wants to show their love that way, it's like, where do you, as a father, where do you put your foot down? And then who do you choose can and can't? Yeah. Yeah, it's, oh, that's tough. That's there's a, tough a predicament one. and a half, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah. It really is. Yeah. Like that's it's also, but you know, on the other end of it, that's it, you guys got a nice big family and they all love them. And, and you know, it yeah. yeah, and that's it. So it's, I it's more positive than negative, I think. And they do a good job. Yeah. Like, so I always say, like, ah, oh, you guys are spoiling. They're like, it's not spoiled. My my Katrina's mom was it's not spoiled, son. He's loved. He's loved. We love him. We're loving him. We're loving him. I'm like, oh God, could you guys love him another way with without toys all the time? <laughs> but until I see, like, and I haven't seen this with him, like uh, he's so far doesn't expect anything he's not selfish with his toys yeah. he doesn't you know throw like just throw it away when he's done like he's he's appreciative of everything so until i see a behavior shift i'm gonna let it ride i'm gonna let them love the way they want to love i'm gonna do my best of cool. managing it as i can and just keep an eye on how he's growing up and until I see like any behaviors that I think are leading to him acting spoiled or resentful or expecting things, and then I feel like that's the only move I got, right? Uh -huh. Good yeah. How about you, Justin? What'd you guys do? Yeah, nothing crazy. I had my parents over and we kind of uh, just did our own like Easter egg hunt and whatnot and played cornhole and like, you know, it was a nice weather. So we do you guys chilling. have, is it just your, your kids were the only kids there? Yeah, or? it was uh -huh. only us. Yeah, we didn't do a big like, Usually we'll go to Courtney's family's a big family and like they have all the cousins and whatnot. And then it's a big deal. But this year we just kind of stayed at my house and just chilled. So it was, yeah, that's it, nice. It was low key. Dude. We, we did, uh, we went to so much, you guys, you had like 20 or so Whoa, or more. Way more. So my, so yeah, my, I saw that video. Was, so my grandfather, uh, passed away, you know, earlier this year and him and my grandmother hadn't been living at their house for a while. So it just kind of sits. There is that whose garage you guys were in? Yeah. So, oh, I was trying to figure out whose garage. So that was. we did, we did eat the, the whole family got together and did Easter. My grandma wanted it at her house. Now she's mm. not, she hasn't lived there for a while cause she needs to be kind of take, yeah. taken care of and stuff. So we all went there and um, and set it all up and uh, I mean I don't know how many people fifty something I don't know it was it was so many people and, and a lot of little kids so you have my two little ones my brother's got a little one he's got one on the way my uh, two of my cousins have little ones one of them has one on the way my sister has a little one so there's all these little kids you know how fun it is doing yeah. Easter egg hunts with little like. You know, two, three year olds run around, one year old. Oh, run that's around. when it actually matters. So this will be so fun. So yeah. it'll be I can't wait to see what with Aurelius because Aurelius is now because Aurelius is only what a year behind Max, right? He's two. So yeah, okay, so two. last year when Max did Easter, he was just kind of figuring it out, like what we were doing. So I'm assuming Aurelius has kind of figured it out this year. Like this is his first year of kind of understanding the hiding and stuff. For the next six months, 
after this, he wanted to hide eggs every day. Oh, that's funny. So it'll be interesting yeah. if you get hit. That's funny because he did it today. Yeah, see, Jessica this, just sent me a video. Bro, that was Max. Max, <laughs> after last year, like he, he was, he it was like the first thing where the light bulb went off, and he liked it so much that every day when I came home from work, oh, yeah. day day hide eggs. I had to hide like you know we had like eight or so of those plastic eggs, and I'd hide them throughout the house, yeah. and then he'd go look for them. It was like a thing for. Like, but it six was months. this was uh, we haven't had a get together like this in a long time because our family's huge. But yeah. you had the garages where. We filled up the garage, we filled up the living room, we filled up the kitchen and the backyard, okay? So, and her house is not a small house. My grandma's house is, a, it's a track home, but it's like 20 something, 100 square feet, Good size. you know, four or five bedroom, right? Tri-level. I mean, it's just, this is how I remember when I was a kid. Like everywhere you go. It's just full of people. Loud yeah. and just people. In fact, my two little ones are not used to this level of just insanity so we walk in and i realize it's like <laughs> he's overwhelmed like, he's pinned to jessica because uh, as soon as he, my family is loud and affectionate but we're very physically affectionate it's like yeah. kiss hug kiss hug kiss hug another one kiss hug so we go in oh my god my mom, you know whatever and my son's like holding on my daughter who's chill she after a little while and she's you know she's only what she five months she, oh she's that's it she just started crying had to take her in the room calm her down <laughs> everybody was squeezing and kissing on her uh -huh. but it was a good time i mean that's was, that's the the dynamic that jessica has with your two little ones is the same dynamic i have yeah. with max and in katrina's family yeah. it's and always to this no exception this this time around if my son cries or has any like is not in his great mood that he always is in ever, it's always because it's too much. Just a lot. It's too much. Yeah. Like we got what he the only it's time over, he cried. It's overstimulating. Yeah. He, the, he started crying because they got silly string and those confetti eggs, and all of a sudden the whole family, whole family, all the adults, going nuts. smashing each other, squirting each other, and they were trying to involve him, and he was like, "Oh, <laughs> fucking, <laughs> fucking touch me!" Yeah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I'm like, "God, you guys not know my yeah. son yet, by now? Yeah. Like, he just like too much. It's already well, loud and crazy." But they they're trying to include him and play. Well, with you know what it fun, is you know? is that you yes. know when they were kids, they grew up in that all the time. Yeah, so they're used to it. Mm -hmm. your, your house is like mine. It's quiet. It's uh -huh. you know, it's organized or whatever. I grew up in chaos. I had four kids, you know, loud ass Italians, mom throwing the wooden spoon across the room. Like it's just blah, you know, all the time. So we'd go to these, and we'd go to my grandma's house for Sunday dinner every single Sunday with all of our cousins. Well, these events where we have everybody together, they don't happen except for right. maybe a couple times a year now. Yeah. And considering, you know, I realize this is two, this is like the second time he's been to one of these. This is the first time Dolly has ever been to one. And it's just a lot, man. You know, the it's thing that, so it'd be, it'd be great. I, I can't wait to talk to Jessica the next time we're all together. Cause I'm curious to like her feeling on, cause there's a part of me, like I'm, I'm torn, right? There's part of me, like Katrina's attitude is like, don't worry, he'll adapt. You know, we'll just keep, <laughs> he'll say like, he'll <laughs> adapt. And I'm like, Hey, part of me doesn't want my son to adapt. Mm -hmm. I like that side of him. Yeah. I like that. He's so chill. Like, I don't want him to adapt to that environment so much that he's fucking all over the place. Like, I love the fact <laughs> that Max is like so chill and I don't want to rob them that of him or change that of him yeah. so it's like there's a part of me that's like yeah i want i definitely want him integrated and he is like i mean obviously all day long he was great it was just at that one moment yeah. when everybody started doing that that was a little much for him so i kind of have this attitude of like yeah like hey when when i start to see that look on him where he's had enough for the day like i'm ready like when we did the wedding we we'll all stayed in this house yeah. 30 people in like one house by like the end of the trip you could tell he was ready to go and then the next day we got we got back into san jose and he, he, Katrina was talking to him and telling him that, oh, you, your cousins are going to come see him. And he, and he was like, who? He wanted to know who was all coming. And she's like, oh, how many? Yeah, yeah. And she goes, just Danielle. He goes, just Danielle? Okay. Like yeah. he didn't want to see everybody. He was just like, I'm cool. Like I did that for like the last four days. Yeah. I'm Plus they're babies, so they get all the attention. Yes. Yeah, so, everybody wants to pick all, him up. Everybody wants to play with him and wrestle with him. And it's just like, yeah, he's not. Sometimes he's into it. Sometimes he's and not. And it's aggressive, dude. My family is, they're, they're, yeah, it's Katrina, they're it's aggressively family. affectionate. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't recognize it as a kid because <laughs> yeah. you're used to it. Yeah. But then later on, you see them pick up your kid and just, I, 15 kisses, ah, and then another one grabs him, ah, and it's around the room. Like, yeah. And then you can see your kid like, ah, what's going on? <laughs> Everybody's kissing me. Yeah. So, but anyway, it was also nice because at the end of the day, we, so we haven't moved stuff out of my grandma's house yet. So at the, at, my grandma wanted people to take things that they wanted. 
So then at the end of it, you know, we were loading up a U-Haul and pulling out stuff out of the house mm. and you kind of go through things that, and you know, that's a house I grew up in. You know? What's the plan for the house? Are you guys going to sell it or are you guys keeping it? What's- I don't know. I don't know how, oh, I don't know what they want. Know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, um, I don't know. It's up to them. My, you know, my, my mom's family is very special because you hear stories about a lot of stories. So I have family, I have a lot of family that works in finance and works in the banking industry and they will tell you. <laughs> endless stories of families getting torn apart Oh yeah, because, because I remember my aunt telling me when I was younger, get a trust, get a trust. She's like, you have no idea how families get torn apart. The best families get torn apart when someone dies and they have to argue over who gets what or whatever, Mm -hmm. you know, make sure everything's planned out. Um, so you hear stories about stuff like this where, you know, grandma dies, mom dies. Next thing you know, brothers and sisters and cousins and uncles are fighting over, but my mom's family is like, they're so special. They're mm-hmm. just very much like, whatever you want, you do this, and yeah. I don't care, and we'll, yeah. you know, and it's uh, it's really nice. It's really nice. Like, so I don't know what they're going to do. Yeah, Katrina's, if they're going to sell it or they're going to keep it. Katrina's mom is, she, and she's already put it in her will, that her house, she doesn't want sold. That's like, that's the community house. It's where everybody, we get together for 90% of the parties and stuff like that. It's that's nice. Been at her mom's house. And like so that. what she wants done is like, they have, she, has another, she has two properties, and she's like, you can sell the other property, yeah. divide it up, I don't give a shit. She goes, with this house, this was your your papa's and I's house, and this is where we host everybody. I want this house to stay like this, and then the family's allowed to come here and use it all they want, but I don't, I don't want to sell it and divide That's it. That's nice. Right? Yeah, so she's That's like stipulated nice. that in her will. I'll tell you what, though. Uh, I'm always reminded. What's the? Let me ask you guys. What's the most biggest pain in the ass thing to move when you're moving something out of a house and you got to go downstairs the dresser. and stuff? dresser. Dresser. That's one. That's definitely up there. But there's one that a lot of people just forget about, but then when you move it, you're like, From this upstairs is upstairs bedroom? Worst. Yeah. Dresser. A dresser sucks yeah, for sure. It used to be the old what, school TVs, but those are easy now. Well, yeah, what, what's worse than a dresser? A big, a big ass mattress. A big ass uh, high quality mattress. I mean, those, yeah, uh, those are those are awkward a pain as ass. fuck. Uh, I'll take it. I'll take that over a dresser. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Because you know why? Because it won't bang the walls yeah. up. You can yeah. shove it, but bro, turn it, picking it up. There's no handles on it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, you got to yeah. squeeze it and do some we weird have, shit with it. We, we have an it's old awkward. Katrina has passed down like 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 real like wood like that's like from like the 40s. Yeah, what is it about old? Furniture because it weighs made, twice. It's made, it's made different. It's way heavy with high quality, yeah. high quality everything. It's heavy. Yeah, the shit we make now is like cheap IKEA shit, garbage. Yeah, mm-hmm. light like like half the way. Dude, weight. my grandma's dresser. Like we try, you try to pick that thing up. You're like, what, they make this out of com- you know <laughs> yeah. concrete. Well, you know what's great about this. So this one oh, that we have oh, in our, our master bedroom yeah. is actually been. Uh, it's I, I believe it's from like the 40s. It's been uh, I'll have to ask or maybe even older. It's been re-sanded and refinished. Like we paid big money to like the way it looks right now. Is I paid more money for that than I would have bought a, a new like but it's nice quality. Yeah, but it's because we sanded it, redid it, yeah. put the new handles on it, yeah. made it look newer. But it's like it's still put together so well. But God, it's a motherfucker to carry up and downstairs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. That's. Have you guys ever looked at the pictures of uh, what two by fours when they used to build? What they build houses? What two by fours used to look like versus now? No. You haven't seen these? No. Okay, so I saw. I mean, me- two by four is is the yeah. measurement. So how would it look yeah, different? Gonna- it's a two inch by four inch. Yeah, maybe it's not two by four. It's what they used to build houses with, and yeah. and the wood is was so much thicker than what they use now. So yeah. I don't know how you can look that up. Doug. Four by fours. Um, maybe they were. Well, yeah, just look at how we're, what what type of lumber was used yeah, for houses and whatever. To because yeah, because two by it four like it was totally the, different. The inches yeah, and that wouldn't look uh, different. You're right. Like yeah. a two, like, like, a two like, by four today is the same that's as a two like, by what's four. What's heavier? A thousand pounds of you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, feathers, feathers or a thousand are, pounds of bricks. <laughs> 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 but I remember someone sent me a picture once, and I looked at it, and I'm like, because my sister, she lives in San Mateo, and she lives in an old house. So these are the kind of houses that you could tell before people needed massive closets and stuff. You ever go to an old house? Yeah. Like if you go here in downtown San Jose, like how those houses look. Yeah. So my sister has one like that, but you go in there and you like, you like knock on the wall or like, you're like, Oh, this is like, like new houses. Like, I feel like I walk through the walls. Yeah. Everything, and my dad told me, cause it's he like did a shell. I know old houses like that actually use real wood. Yeah. My dad's like, cause he did work for the house and he goes, mm-hmm. Sal, he goes, you wouldn't even imagine how freaking like hard it was to break shit out of this house. Oh, they yeah. made these things so and they sturdy. They have composite and they have all kinds of like materials that you can do instead that people use. But yeah, it's like cheap shit. Yeah. It's crazy. Oh yeah. So they've actually made them smaller. Oh, see? So, so they're I'm, like one and a half by yeah. three and a half inches, really. That's what I... Uh-huh. I told you. Wow. Yeah. So That's an old two by four. That's ridiculous. Look at that. So yeah. it's, it's okay. So are, are you telling me that one of those is a true two by four inches and then the other one is... So the two by... What we call two by fours today aren't even really two by fours? Yeah, yeah I believe... Like three yeah. and a half. 
So I believe, yeah, now they're one and a half by three and a half inches. Yeah, three and is, and a half that, is, is that right? Yeah. And, it's, and, and it has to do with uh, maximum moisture content. Mm -hmm. Look at that. After 1964, it has 30% less volume. Wow. That's crazy. So now you yeah. can. Now What's you really can, crazy about it is that we called that a two by four then and we call it a two by four and now. He, we shaved it down like a half inch and it's still yeah. a two by four. Fucking inflation's a motherfucker. So now, now you can lie to a girl. How, how big are you? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, two by four. <laughs> <laughs> Back in 1964, it's different. Yeah, thirty percent off. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. That's standard. Give yourself the half <laughs> inch bump. Hey, but yeah. that's not a little difference, dude. No, that's huge. Look at yeah, that piece yeah. of wood. Yeah. That is very different. I had no, I, I had no girth. idea that two by fours today are not true two I knew by it. fours. I knew yeah, it. look at that. That's crazy. I yeah. didn't know that either. Yeah, yeah that's. Anyway. I mean, well, I, I, have, I have a carpenter for a dad. A I, I always that. wondered about. Honestly, because like we'd go buy two by fours and it was like three and a half, and I'm like, why? Like, I guess that was just the standard. I didn't know before it was actually a true four inch. So you've mm. actually you've actually measured these new two yeah, by fours. Yeah, 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 oh, see, yeah, I've never even noticed that. I've worked with them with my dad as a kid forever. You account for it because it's. Like it's just like par for the course, you know. Mm. It's like it's in 2018, uh, Home Depot filed a lawsuit that the common lumber sizing was misleading for consumers, but the judge dismissed it. No mm. shit, I, I had no idea about that. Judge. Failure in the justice system. <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> Jeez. this conspiracy is everywhere. happening <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> they start with I didn't that. Even look there. What's next? Yeah, oh. that's wild. Oh, where I are we know, going? I do not know that. Hey, can we? Uh, you, I see you two assholes have already taken a bite out of these. <laughs> I couldn't help it. Yeah, dude, you so, put a cookie in front of me. Of course, I'm gonna well, take so, a bite. Okay, so we called for it like a couple weeks ago that we have heard people have been using the creatures of habit and making cookies out of it. So, for people who don't know, creatures of habit is a high pro protein oatmeal so it's an oatmeal you make it in the morning 30 grams of protein it's got probiotics mm. vitamin d tastes amazing so this is a creatures of habit high protein oatmeal cookie yeah so i can eat it now i already took a bite but it's really good yeah. it's actually really really good so go. now here's the deal adam is in, he cannot lie oatmeal. when he thinks something's gross even if it's a sponsor he'll admit it raisin so what do you think oatmeal that's raisin. Really good. it is right it's actually very good yeah was, I, I told you we have to thank uh ben shea Okay. Out of uh, Idaho. He's a pharmacist. He found mm. us through John Deloney's show. Oh, wow. He went out and bought Sal's book and started doing the workout, the total dumbbell workout in the book. And then he's moved on to MAPS 15. Now he's into MAPS suspension. Awesome. And he's going to be going into MAPS uh, anabolic. Oh, anyway. What are, what are the ingredients? So, yeah. So he sent yeah, an entire good. recipe. All tasty. right. Uh -huh. Right here. And uh, it's like any other cookie, of course. It's not like any type of special health <laughs> recipe. There's butter and got, sugar. Got in butter, there. egg, sugar, uh, salt, cinnamon, of course, baking soda, two packets of creatures of habit oatmeal, and some flour. And uh, yeah, we'll post it in the uh, yeah. Guess, so I mean, we may be getting some more since it's been some time here yeah. since we last asked and I think yeah, some good. other people it's really well, good you know what I want to know because obviously mm. it tastes just like a real cookie macros yeah is what the macros are and more some. it's going to be like a cookie it's going to be sweet but I'd like to know if each cookie had like at least 10 grams of protein no he he figures about 4 grams of protein oh he actually said it in there yeah but hold on a second it's only a cookie this big for 4 grams of protein is a yeah, lot yeah it's small yeah, you, it's you not bad because yeah. Justin easily you eat, you eat 15 of, of them probably for 15. <laughs> so he's easily. just guessing I mean it's not scientific here I mean we can take this recipe and figure it out if we got so ambitious and uh, yeah. gotten the exact macros. Math. But right. yeah, I don't, I don't think we're going to go that far. No. But I mean, yeah, we'll I, share the recipe. I, what I like about stuff like that is that if I were to bake some cookies, like that's what I would do. Yeah, though. why not? At least I get some protein in there, right? Yeah, help blunt the insulin response and all that stuff. And oh, they taste good. great. Yeah. Oh, that would be cool to do that yeah, with the glucose tasty. monitor see to see a difference. difference. Yeah. Oh, that would be a fun little yeah, test. Oh, by the way, he used vanilla uh, Creatures of habit. That yes. was the flavor. Yeah, okay. I mean, so I mean, you could have used like chocolate. Maple, or something maple's else. a good one. Maple might yeah. be good. I I think some of them. You know what I really like is because I already liked all the stuff that's in the creatures. Have like the the seeds and everything. That, that's in there. It goes great with the cookie. It does. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, speaking of math, I want to ask you, Adam, what you know about this proposal for forty year mortgages that's going on? <laughs> which so we just on, went thirty. Which, now we're <laughs> jumping to forty. So you definitely called this on a previous podcast. You, Long you, time ago, you yeah. predicted that they're probably going to do this. Yeah. To keep blowing up the the I guess the real estate pump bubble. pump it up. So, yeah, I think so. I don't I don't know much about what you sent over as far as like is it is it passed is it is it government insured and backed like where it's at. I know that there was rumblings of this uh, already over a year ago, um, and it just seemed obvious. 
with what's happening with inflation, with the amount of money printing that we did, and even like with what they think with life expectancy. So I think, and and what people are working later. So we have all these factors. Oh, so it, ma- people, it makes sense in that regard, right? That's right. It may, so you have uh, the average person is now working longer than the old retirement age. So you're already working longer. We believe that <sighs> life expectancy is going to increase on these people because of all the biohacking and, and health. You know, people are focused more on that. So that's going to go up. Then you figure inflation. Then you figure money printing. It just seems like the obvious storm that we're going to normalize 40-year mortgages. No, it says right here, I just put up, the the Federal Housing Administration announced it's increasing term options to include a 40-year mortgage in May. So it's happening. So May, huh? Yeah, so FHA loan modifications are applied when borrowers are in default of their existing. Okay, so this is going to be a new loan that you're going to see uh, on the market. And That's, I forgot the wow. statistic, another another factor to add to why I thought this too. So there's, I saw a statistic one time of the percentage of people that that make their home buying decision based off of their payment. So it's, and it's extremely high. It's like north of like 80%. So most everybody, when they decide let's buy this house, they base it off of their monthly payment. They don't, they don't care. They don't consider I'm, I'm going to pay it off. That's right. And the same, and we saw this, we saw the same thing in, in the car loans and maybe Doug, cause car, Doug got his car probably first before any of us, you know, it, it wasn't until recent. Did we ever see seven and eight year? I think there's even now a nine year car loan. Like that's crazy. Like that didn't exist way back when. Like, do they uh, have them for Model Ts back then? <laughs> <laughs> car, car loans were much shorter back. Then. Yeah, I think so. I was it's in the chariot. car industry yeah. for like one year. I sold Chevrolets. <laughs> what year? Do you remember? This was back in 1991, I okay. believe, or 1990. So, what were our car loans back like? I there? think the longest you could go was either a five year or yeah. six year. About yeah. five years, not I'm a six, sure. five, probably a long. five year yeah. loan. And then before yeah. that, there were short, like, cars didn't last a long time too. If you go way back, I remember when cars 100,000 miles in a car was like you throw it away. But at the dealership, right. they always sold the payment. They never sold the cost. Well, that right. was always a way car. to sell yeah. someone. That's yeah. right. I mean, the housing is the same way too. So when you think about that, it just makes sense that they would extend the loan because in the average American that looks and goes like, oh, we can now, aff- this house that was no longer affordable by it out. Yeah, tacking on an extra 10 years, bad. then now they can afford it. And so, yeah, to me, I mean, it wasn't like too... Nostradamus for me to call that. I really felt like this <laughs> kind of obvious to me. I was yeah, like, yeah. all these things add up. It's gonna, it's gonna go that route. Yeah, it makes and, sense. Yeah. Makes sense. So, all right, I got some something interesting for you. Did you guys know? You ready for this? This is this is how you know. Well, this isn't just how you know. There's a lot of ways we know right now. But there's a new mm-hmm. New York is considering a bill that they're gonna pass that's gonna ban Marks. weight discrimination. What's that look like? Weight discrimination. So it's going to add to the, it's going to add weight to the list of protected groups. So right now you're a protected group based off of your race, your gender, religion, disability, but now they're going to include obesity to that. So how are they going to handle that when you don't have like a seat available or something on a bus and somebody or wherever, you know, where these discrepancies are going to happen? I have no idea, but yeah. now uh, if you fi- get fired, don't get fired. Your boss treats you a particular way. Something happens at a store. These aisles are too small. What These could seats go are too wrong? Small. This is weight discrimination. Now, and if it's a protected class, then yeah, you got yourself so it's like a, a case. hate crime. Yeah. Is that how they're gonna? Now, what is correct? What, what is your philosophy? So calling someone fat, like yeah, you fat, whatever. That would be like a hate crime. Wow. By the way, all crimes are hate Crazy. crimes. This is the th- the thing about cra- hate cri- crime laws is interesting to me. If you hurt someone. Like, you know, if you shoot someone and because you just wanted to kill them versus if you shoot them because you want to kill them because you don't like their race. Yeah. One the, the one of them gets punished more because it's a hate crime, mm-hmm. but they're both hate crimes. Right. You kill someone, you kill someone. It's right. always and two, so it's yeah, an interesting. It, yeah. You, the person prosecuting could create a good enough narrative where it looks like they had a hate, you know, motivation to it when to they extend their sentence. Yeah. So here it's so what it literally, you know, they're what this what they're saying is that New York City is expected to approve a bill that would ban weight discrimination in housing and hiring. How do they prove that? How I, do they prove that? Do you, now, don't you, I'm like, you you tend to- This, this is insane. Be dude. more into the political stuff. Like, isn't this just a move to, because you know that a majority of people now are going to fit in this category and it's going that way even more, that all you're really trying to do is win over votes from yeah. that population? Sure. Like, only- is that really all you, like, it doesn't even yeah. matter how this plays out, if yep. it could even be enforced. It's that I'm really just pandering 
to the the majority of people and make it sound like I'm advocating for them, right? Yeah, Isn't yeah, that yeah. really what it's all about? Hundred percent. Yeah, because so yeah, there you know it could. This is how it could play out. So yeah, I don't want people to consider open up a can of worms doing that. Let me let me put it play it out for you. You hire somebody, okay, and they're like, I, I can't make it to work today, and this happens like ten times in a row. And you're like, listen, man, you don't come to work, you're fired. And it's like, listen, I'm 450 pounds, and it's hard for me to walk uh, yeah. down the stairs. My scooter right now. died. Yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Right. Like so, oh, I can't fire you. You got to pay for that person or whatever. Uh, this it's this is strange. It's a very strange world uh, that we're moving into with some of this, you know, kind of stuff. And yes, it is pandering right. because either a you're overweight, and by the way, if you view the world in this lens, because this I'm sure this happens, but if you view the, in other words, I'm not saying this doesn't happen, but if your lens is everybody's discriminating me against me because of X, Y, and Z, you're going to see it way more than it actually exists. Of course. Yep. You're going to see the person who didn't smile at you on the bus or the cashier that was an asshole or you did get fired or you have the interaction with somebody. And maybe it's just because you're an asshole. Maybe they had a bad day. Maybe their freaking dog died. Who knows? But if that's the lens, mm -hmm. then everything's going to fall under that category and you're going to see it when it's not there. And so this kind of and stuff. You attract it. Yeah. And you become this like hyper vigilant. It's because I'm fat. Everybody's, uh, uh yeah. it's because I'm fat. Uh, yeah. They don't, you know, whatever. So it's a interesting sign of the times a little bit. Weird. Yeah. So anyway, we'll see what happens. Do we have a uh, shout out? So I have a, a shout out and it came up when I was doing my, um, my day in the life thing and I was answering questions and somebody was asking me about squat universities, uh, content, like how I would rate it. And I mean, I said 10 out of 10, I think their yeah. stuff is phenomenal. They're awesome. And, I, the reason why I think they were asking is there's always like, for example, uh, we, we all wear chucks. We talk about wearing chucks. He's done videos like breaking down why chucks are not a superior lifting shoe and because sure. what happens with your toe spread. But this is an area in, I know this is a shout out for squat university, but I also want to point something out that I don't like about our, our space and how people perpetuate this by starting these debates and conversations. You're talking about two companies, our company and a company like squat university where I would say we're damn near 100% aligned on most most content. That doesn't mean there's not going to be a, a thing that we communicate differently than he does. That's the best way to say it. Right. Yeah. And and so that doesn't mean that like you you just oh his stuff is trash cuz we say this and he says that. It's like no, it's like we 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 there's humans are so nuanced. There's so many different ways to approach training and diet and stuff like that. We also like to focus on like the real big. That's right. The, stuff, the, yeah. the, 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 the core of his philosophy that he teaches is phenomenal. And the content that he puts out is amazing. Does that not mean that between him and us who have put out combined tens of thousands of videos and, and podcasts that you're not going to be able to find something where he said different than we said. And then, you know, therefore like, Oh, you, you said you agree with him. Yeah. What's well, like, does that mean that we agree exactly on everything? No, it doesn't mean that. And nor does that mean that I can't still rate someone like that. I think a 10 out of 10, because I think the stuff he's putting out is phenomenal. All right, check this out. We work with a company called joy mode uh, that makes some supplements. One in particular actually improves sexual benefits, sexual performance. Uh, you feel better while doing it. You want to do it more often. And these are all science-based uh, ingredients and they're legit. So we wouldn't work with a company that makes up crap. This is legit. It actually works. The science backs it up. Go check them out. They also have testosterone boosters and other products on their site. But the sexual performance enhancer, that one's the real deal. Go check them out. Go to usejoymode.com forward slash mind pump. Use the code mind pump at checkout for 20% off your first order. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Erica from Oklahoma. Hey, Erica. How can we help you? Hey, guys. Um, Longtime listener. I've been listening to you guys since 2019. Thank you for everything that you put out. Um, since November, I've actually been working with um, some of the MP hormones folks. Um, been having symptoms of low testosterone for a really, really long time. Kind of put it off for... I'd say three or four years, finally decided to work with a specialist. And I can say that I'm pretty happy with the results overall. Um, like I said, I've been on TRT since November. I've put on 
almost 10 pounds, just generally speaking. I'm thinking a lot of it is lean mass. My strength gains have gone up considerably. Um, to give you context, I've gone from basically like 135 pounds to 145 pounds within that span of five months. Um, but my question is more along the lines of like women and hormone therapy in general. My macros really haven't adjusted too much. So I didn't quite know if there's a way to just be putting on this much size without necessarily eating a lot more. Um, I eat about 160 grams of protein every day. I track my macros pretty strictly. Um, so I eat anywhere between 23, 2400 calories plus a day. Um, but yeah, I just would love to hear your thoughts because there's just not a lot of information out there for women specifically, like going on hormone therapy and talking about their TRT. So I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. Yeah. So, um, if you went on, it, first off, obviously we're not doctors, so this is just based off of our understanding, uh, from working with these people. And of course our own experience, when you go from low testosterone to high normal testosterone, the muscle building signal goes from really low to high. Okay. So even with your current, even if your diet stays the same, more of those calories, proteins, fats, carbohydrates will get shuttled towards building muscle than before. Okay. So that's number one. So you, and you are going to see your strength gains go up partially because you build more muscle, but also partially because there's lots of evidence to, that shows that testosterone really gets the CNS to fire up more. So like more energy, more strength, the ability to summon more, uh, you know, more power, better recovery, better recovery, all that stuff. Now, the other thing, part that a lot of people um, don't realize is there is an expected increase in water gain that comes from going on testosterone in both men and in women. Now, the, it varies depending on the person and it can be bloat. Sometimes it's just intracellular fluid. Obviously working with a doctor, they'll be able to balance this out with you and you'll tell them how you feel and they'll look at other, because it's not just testosterone, it's testosterone relationship to estrogen and progesterone and and then, of course, they're going to go off of, you know, your subjective feelings type of stuff. So weight gain is expected just from that. And if you get a body fat test, it won't show up because lean body mass is anything that's not body fat. So if you gained, let's say, out of the eight pounds that you said you gained uh, or 10 pounds, let's say uh, four pounds was water and six pounds was muscle. All of that will register as lean body mass on a body fat uh, test because body fat test just measures uh, body fat. Um, that being said, uh, you really have to base it off of, I would say how you feel, um, you know, muscle can, is very dense. If you're a lean, you know, 145 at your height versus a higher body fat percentage, 130 at your height, it's going to look very different. You might not even look bigger. You just might look, and oftentimes this is the case with people when I train people where they get a little leaner, build some muscle, they're heavy on the scale, but everybody's like, you look like you lost weight. Um, because muscle is shaped differently. It's more sculpted and that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, you're, you're going to see some, um, some of that gain. And then the muscle gain, the initial year is where you'll see most of the muscle gain that you'll get from, uh, being on TRT. Um, and that's with good diet and exercise. After that, it's going to slow down quite a bit because your body's used to that testosterone signal. Um, so it's not like you're going to be on this ramped up, like I'm just going to keep building, uh, crazy amounts of muscle and strength all the time. You're just, your body's. Yeah, that's what it feels like right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I just keep going. Like, it's kind of, it's really wild. I don't really have a emotion around it quite yet, but I'm just still kind of not wanting it to keep going and look like the Hulk in 12 months, but I guess I probably won't. Do don't that. worry. The other, yeah. going the other direction is actually <laughs> really easy. So it's not, you know what this really highlights though? This is just an example of why it isn't as simple as just uh, calories and macros and then lifting is that, you know, if your home hormone profile is off and is not opt optimal for building muscle, and then you go and you balance that out like you've done, your body's responding. Your body's responding the way it should to all the hard work that you were probably were doing in prior years, right? Of And this is a lot of totally. times how we get clients like this is their... And, where we would recommend to go see a hormone specialist is I know like I have a client who I've trusted that, you know, she's weighing her food. She's tracking everything. I know they're training good because I'm the one training them. It's mm -hmm. like they're sleeping well, but yet for some reason 
the, the results aren't adding up and it's like, oh, then we go find out, we get their blood work done and their hormone profiles off. And then the doctor bounces out and then boom, all of a sudden, no change in diet, no change in routine, not doing anything different. And then all of a sudden they're getting stronger, they're building muscle, yeah. they're leaning out. And that just highlights how important it is to have those hormones balanced yeah. out for you. Erica, the other thing too, is you're doing testosterone replacement therapy. <laughs> which is very different from an athlete, like a female athlete or bodybuilder taking anabolic steroids. Now they may also use testosterone, the doses, are but really they're not trying to get their levels oh, to, to, you know, high normal or within a, a range. They're way above range. They're taking like, you know, mo like 10 times as much as you may be five or 10 times as much as you're taking plus stacking on top of it, other hormones and stuff to look the way that they look. So no, you're not going to, it's not going to be infinite. You're not going to just keep building muscle until, you know, you look like, uh, like Justin or something like that. It's not going to happen. So, um, and if you want to, um, yeah, that's, yeah. that's probably not going to happen, but also, program. but again, you're working with the, with the specialist. So a lot of people think more is better. I mean, I know people who go on hormone, uh, replacement therapy and end up realizing that, Oh, the dose is a little too high. Let me bring it down. And then other people were like, actually, I feel better at a bit of a higher dose. Everybody thinks higher is going to feel better. Um, that's not, especially with right. women, that's not the case, especially with women because they're so much more sensitive uh, to, to testosterone than men um, are. So you're within a range and you're working with a specialist. Um, and again, it's not, even if you were, even if you did have some crazy, like unexpected, like super muscle building effect, which uh, isn't, isn't going to happen. But even if that did, it's not like you wouldn't be able to, you know, reverse course type of deal. But I'd like to hear your experience. You're saying it's been amazing so far. So you got, you're stronger, recovery's better. How's energy? How's uh, appetite, libido, mood, all that stuff? Literally all of those things are better. It's been wild. Um, and again, I'm, yeah, I'm someone who was dialed in for quite some time. So it was frustrating to not feel that way, despite taking really good care of myself, you know, having a pretty solid relationship with alcohol and all that stuff. Um, sex drive is amazing. And so well that my husband actually decided to do hormone replacement therapy as well. <laughs> to keep up. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, literally, literally. I mean, within like the first four weeks, like my, my strength was fine for a really like long time. I was sort of plateaued in so many ways in some of my lifts and like my back squat went from like being able to max out at like 155 to like, I can do like 225 now for Goodness. one or two reps. Like it's really wild. Like how much has changed in that, in that realm. Um, and sleep has been like a lot deeper too. I feel a lot better rested, less sore, definitely recovering a lot better. So literally all other biofeedback is, is awesome. I have skin issues. I will say like some of like my breakouts are kind of like, which I've always kind of been, someone who's prone to like acne and that sort of thing. So that's sort of something that I'm working on with my doctor too, but that's really like nothing compared to everything else that's been going on. That's been positive. I'm so glad you said yeah. that because um, for anybody listening right now, you know, it's not the, it's not the cure all uh, it, normal healthy levels of hormones are different than supplementing. Supplementing is definitely good when you're low and you can't fix it on your own or you can't figure out how to fix it on your own. But if you can raise it naturally or balance things out naturally, that's the way to go. And the reason why I'm saying that is I don't want people listening who lead an unhealthy lifestyle to think, well, I'm going to just do this and it's going to fix everything. This works best when you're already, yeah. you're doing everything, you're exercising, you're eating, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to get good sleep and it's just, it's just for whatever reason, not working. Then you add this and you adjust it. And then it is like a, a total game Sounds changer. Like it was the key that really unlocked all these results to finally happen. You're right. Putting all the work in and it's like, you know, this was one of those last factors. So yeah. I've had clients like this before. And so it's just really, you're just nervous. Cause it's like, it's all working so well right <laughs> yeah. now. Right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I did a lot of self-study. I just, I put it off. I knew I had another doctor actually who brought it up that I had low T and I honestly, at that point in time, a couple of years ago, didn't really know enough about it. Wasn't like educated on it. And I was like, why do I need testosterone? Like, who cares? I'm fine. Um, and then was kind of looking at more thyroid stuff and that didn't end up actually helping at all. Just looking at the thyroid. So yeah, it definitely has. Testosterone was the key for me, for sure. Yeah. Well, well, good deal. Well, you're definitely on the right track. I think you're doing everything right. You're the perfect candidate for something like this. So, yeah, I'd like to, Erica. I'd like to throw you in our our. Are you in our private forum? Our mind our mind pump private forum. 
No. Yeah, I'd love to throw you in there because we do have a lot of a lot of people that actually ask questions, and you could be a great resource to share your story if you're willing to when people ask. Because uh, there's some people in there that have been asking questions about female hormones and are, are nervous to potentially do TRT, and so having more people like yourself that can share your experience, I think, would be of value for them. Oh, for sure. Happy to. Awesome. Right, awesome. Doug, we'll put you in there. You're in there. Thanks for calling in, Erica. Yeah, thanks so much. You got it. Yeah, you know, unfortunately, estrogen has been labeled the female hormone and testosterone has been labeled the male hormone. And the average person- As if both aren't important to both yeah. sexes. Yeah, both. both. Pe yes. People don't realize that they're both- very Now, the ratios- from between you know men and women of how much testosterone how much estrogen is very different yeah but they're both critical hormones for both genders if your estrogen is off as a male you will lose strength you'll become depressed your bones will get weaker you'll have uh, less energy you'll feel more pain you're 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 going to be less healthy you'll have more risk of heart disease if your testosterone is off and you're a woman You'll also gain all those things. So they're both very important. The key is the balance yeah. and how your body's reacting to those. So like men, like for example, um, if you go on a testosterone replacement therapy and then take something to reduce conversion to estrogen and actually reduce your estrogen too much, you'll feel like garbage. You'll feel like total garbage. You need to have estrogen if you're a man and you need to have testosterone if you're a woman. It's just the, the ratios. Uh, is, this is, is, different. This yeah. is why I think the hardest clients ever to help for me was like women going through menopause. Like when they have, when they're getting hit with that, like yeah. just tornado of hormones up and down and all over the place. Yeah. Like it is so hard to show that client really good results because of this. You're fighting yeah. it. Yeah. You're, I mean, it's such a, a I always had it. such a hard time with, with clients that were going through menopause because of this situation. Like if your hormones are not balanced out, like to get your body to build muscle and to burn body. It's like in survival mode and trying to figure out what the fuck is yeah. going on. So to ask it to go do something for you in addition to that, it's just hard. And then the idea that you want to push it or stress it more to get it to respond away, it's just, it's an uphill battle. So I just think it just highlights that. Our next caller is Carrie from Maryland. Carrie, what's happening? How can we help you? Not much, man. How you guys doing? Good, good, good Great, man. man. Hey, I just started recently listening to you guys' show, man, and I take a lot of good um, advice from you guys, so I'm hoping you can help me with my question. Um, just to give a little backstory, though, I um, just started recently competing last year. I, I did my first show before um, I was 39. I was getting ready to turn 40. It was just another goal for me to reach as far as my fitness journey. Um, I did three shows last year. My first show, I weighed in roughly 185. My last show, I weighed in roughly 193. After the second show, I actually trans, um, I relocated from Texas to Maryland now, and I started working with a new nutrition coach. Now, the thing is, he's had me on a bulk since, um, I want to say December, until the mid middle of March. I got up to 220 pounds. That's the biggest I've ever been. and I'm kind of concerned that I put on a little more fat than I needed to. I posted a, a video to my Instagram and my former coach uh, made a comment that I was, he said I was bulking up. I look good, but I was holding too much weight around my core area. And so I was just wanting to ask the question now, when would be a good time for me? If I'm eight weeks out, I'll say, when would be a good time to start? my cutting process have and then you can provide any tips to to give as far as to keep my lean muscle mass while cut so i have a lot of thoughts around this carrie um one do you know where your body fat percentage is right now my body fat percentage the thing is i i heard i've heard you guys talk about doing a dex scan i haven't actually went and done those but i did do like a what is it like a body analysis at one of the little fitness shops around here yeah and the reading that it came back, it was saying that my body fat was like 30 something, but it was saying that I was overweight. But the guy told me not to really pay that, a, not don't pay any attention because it doesn't take into account my shoulder width. And yeah, you don't look no 30% body fat, brother. There ain't no way you're 30% body fat. <laughs> yeah, no, you're not 30% body fat. So, okay, I would, I mean. Well, I'm used to, I'm used to being at my, or close to my show weight. So me being, I'm currently 215 now. I was telling my nutrition coach, hey, maybe we should start cutting some things. So he did cut out a bagel because post-workout, I would have two scoops of my protein shake and then a, a bagel. So he took the bagel away and he increased my cardio from 30 minutes to 40 minutes, two times a day. 
Yeah. Have you, so have you, you just started listening to the show, so you didn't get to listen to my whole journey to pro and stuff like that, did you? No. And actually the show that I'm, well, I'm doing a warm up show that I'm eight weeks out from, but I'm actually trying to go in to get my pro card. That's what I'm going to do now. So if you actually Google mind pump Adam's journey to pro card, you can actually listen to the episodes where I share a lot of the stuff going on uh, with my diet and training heading up to my pro card. Um, okay. but I, I'm, I come from the camp of more like your, your first nutrition coach. I don't like, um, I, I think a mistake a lot of coaches make is bulking their, their competitors up way too much in the off season. I, I want to stay, I want to stay somewhere between five to 6% body fat from what I want my stage body fat to be. So I'm, I like to hover in the off season, nine to 11, maybe 12% at the highest. Cause I'm kind of, mm-hmm. I'm going to come into stage around three, 4% tops body fat. And the reason why I want to do that is because what's going to happen to you right now with this hard, this, uh, this big of a bulk is to try and cut all that body fat out in a, in a short period of time or that you're going to start doing things like cutting calories, like crazy, increasing cardio, like crazy. And then the body will start to adapt, right? You, it'll respond for about a week. Then you'll have to do it again. And then it'll respond for about a week or two. Then you'll do it again. And then before you know it, you're four or five weeks still out and you're like starving and you're doing already an hour or more cardio a day and the body just it revolts. I mean, it's, it, it, it's going to say, dude, you're not feeding me enough. You're stressing me. You're pushing me too hard. And then competitors show up to stage and they're not as lean as what they were before because the body just, and by the way, this gets more and more difficult for you and I as as the shows keep compiling up, right? Show after show after show after show of you exactly. continually stressing the body through diet like that. And the greater the swings of body fat to reducing the body fat, the more you're stressing the body out and the less likely it's going to respond the same way. So competitors run into this all the time where they're like, man, all the shit that I did at the last show it produced a way better result than I did the same formula. I ate the same way. I trained the same way. I did the cardio the same mapped out and then I didn't look as good. And so they help, they always had to keep ramping up intensity and eventually you hit a wall and the body stops responding. And so, you know, you, you're in a situation right now where it's like, fuck, what would I do with you? Like right here, it's hard to say because your only option is probably what your coach is going to start doing, which is just starting to cut your calories, increase your cardio to try and lean you out as fast as possible. But I really think he's kind of setting you up for failure because of how high you got your body, your, uh, your body weight to what you, what, cause you hit stage. You said it, how much one ninety or I'll just go back to my last show. I was at one ninety three. I've never really been over 200 pounds. I think the highest I've been before was two Oh five maybe, but for me to go to two twenty. Yeah, bro. And now I'm 215 currently. I think there's a lot of stuff I need to start doing, right? Yeah. Now. So here, here's a generic, this is a generic answer because it's going to do every, but a generic rule of thumb for me is I, I know that if I've dieted well in the off season, I've done a good job on my programming, I've kept myself at a decent, I can drop a half a percent to a percent of body fat a week. That is, that is a, a safe kind of goal. Now, I want, I'm always planning for a half, but I know if I push the body, I could probably get a percent down a week. So do the math on that. Like if you're carrying yourself 10% higher body fat percentage than your, your, your stage body fat percentage and you've only got eight weeks, you're fucked. Like you're gonna, you're gonna, you're not gonna get to the the body fat percentage you want. And that's saying 1% a week. And I don't like to plan for that. I like to plan for half a percent a week is what I'm gonna drop. So, so that's how I do the math on how far I got to start my prep to get ready for a show. And the yeah. leaner you keep yourself in the off season, the easier that's going to be. The more body fat percentage you put on, the harder that's going to be. Yeah, I would say you have a test show before the real sh- the show that really matters. Um, so, I would, I would do. Sorry, I was just going to say um, I, the test show that I was going to do is actually eight weeks out. My the show to get my pro card is actually ten weeks out now. Okay, I would do it careful, smooth, and controlled for the first show. Yeah, and just see what, and then don't worry about where your placing is, and then from there decide if you want to do the big show. You, you got to do you. You can't don't what what you you're gonna fuck yourself if you try and come to this pre-show really really tight. You just gotta accept that you're gonna be soft, like you're not gonna look great. Just accept that because if if you come in if you come and try to come in too hard and come in too lean. To this show, you're gonna fuck your prep for the yeah. Because lo- he's looking to lose because you're two sixteen, two fifteen, and you want to get down to one ninety three probably. 
I want to get no. I want to get down to at least two hundred. So you want to lose a minimum of fifteen pounds in eight weeks? Yeah, that's aggressive. I mean, that's a, that's going to be a bit aggressive, especially without trying to lose muscle. Um, so that's going to be that's that was gonna, the other thing too. I don't want to lose the muscle mass that yeah. I did. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and did, by the way, Kerry, this is exactly what happens to competitors when they bulk too much in the off season. They yeah. put on so much body fat, and then they get in a predicament where they have to cut aggressively to get down to the weight. And then at the end of the show, if you did a if you let you did a body fat test before and then after, they look at all that hard work and they literally at the same at the same lean body mass. They didn't gain any muscle. They did all that hard bulking. And then at the end of the cut, they end up having to lose just as much muscle as they did fat to get down to that stage weight because they had to cut so aggressively. So um, this is hard, bro, because if you, if I was coaching you, if I was still doing this and you called me up like this and you like, Hey, Adam, I, I don't like my coach. I, will you, will you take me on? I would, ref, I would actually refuse you. I'd be like, I, I, I'm not in a position to do you right. This close to the show. I would say, let's, let's plan for a show further out for your pro card and let's really let's really slowly lean you out in a very slow controlled way and honestly bro i wouldn't even have you doing any cardio yet i'd want you doing it through diet manipulation and training to slowly kind of lean you out until you're at a closer body fat percentage and then you and i'd be talking i'd be like all right carrie you're you're right around eight nine percent right now now let's go target a show eight eight weeks out and then I would, I would, and I'd want your metabolism also to be in a good place too. So I don't know where your calories are at right now. Are you, tell me you're right above. now. I'm at, um, I started at roughly 3000, but now I'm at, um, 2400. You're already at 2400 and you got to drop. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. I, I would slow down. I would wait, you know, here's a rule of thumb. Don't force your body to make the show, find a show that's going to work with your body. So what Adam basically said is slowly cut. Do it the right way. Slowly cut till you're about nine eight percent, and then find a show that's like ten weeks out, and then tr try and do that. They actually have another pro show that I could do, which is actually what well, if it's ten weeks. I think it would probably be thirteen weeks out. It's just in a different location, which is a yeah. little further out. But I I didn't mind driving there because it, it was either going to be the one that I'm planning for or that one. So I just wanted whichever one I was going to be ready for. I just know a lot of those guys are extra big and. I was just trying to put on as much muscle as possible. I mean, you're, but I also don't want to get on stage and still be fluffy either. What class are you? How tall are you? Um, six one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Look, is look, that F? Is that F? Is that the? Is that the tall? I mean, it's class D. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, look, um, big and smooth will always lose to smaller and lean. So a lot of guys play the size game, and um, being conditioned usually beats out size. Of course, conditioned and size is, is always the best. But you play the size game, take your time. I I look, the key to not losing muscle when you're cutting is uh, how, fat, how fat you let yourself get in the bulking process and then how short the cut is. That's the biggest key. Everybody wants to know the secret to not lose muscle in 10 weeks. And it's like, you got to lose 20 pounds in 10 weeks. I mean, yeah, eat high protein, lift weights, all that stuff, but there's not much you could do. You're going to lose some muscle. Kerry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have Doug put you in our private forum for free. And okay. um the guys and I are in there. I also have, there's other competitors that are in there that have, that have done shows. There's also even some, uh, athletes that I've coached and trained that are in there too. I want you to okay. get in there and just keep, keep me updated. Okay. Just update me every week or every two weeks. And when you, when you, uh, when you up, let me know like, Hey, how, how the training, the diet, what your coach is telling you, everything, just give me a little bit of an update, tag me. So my, so it pops up because we get a lot of people talking in there. If you don't tag me, I won't see it. But if you tag me, I'll see it. And I'll, okay. I'll, I'll keep an eye on you. I'll keep an eye on what what your coach has got you doing, where you're currently at. I do recommend going and getting like a, a legit body fat test. It's worth uh, it's worth doing that so we have a better gauge. And then in the future, a really good rule of thumb, like I said, is to plan a show wherever your body fat percentage is at. You plan on you're losing a half a percent a week. If you're if your metabolism is healthy, you're in a good place. A half a percent is a safe spot. Yes, we could probably get a percent off a week really aggressively, but I don't want to plan for that. I want to plan for a half a percent a week, knowing that in my back pocket, I could get you to ramp it up and hit a percent a week. So do it do it that way. That's a that's a good gauge on okay, is this enough time for me to to hit peak for the show? Gotcha, gotcha. All right, thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah man. For for sure, Kerry. Keep keep us posted, man. 
I will do, man. Yeah. Hey. What, hey, what's the what's the name of the what what is it? It's IFBB, right? I'm I'm assuming that you're you're. you're... Uh, it's MP. Well, the show that I was doing for Pro is NPC Universe. It's in Teaneck, New Jersey. Okay. But they also have another one that's going to be in Pittsburgh. That's on July the 15th. So. I may take you guys' advice and just push it out so I can give myself a little more time. Yeah, I think you. Sh- I think you should, bro. I totally think you should, and I think you should just kind of sl- slowly, not aggressively, lean out right now and do as little as cardio as you have to right now. We all. I always like to have the cardio button the last like couple weeks so we could get crazy if we have to. Like we're and if you haven't done it a lot in prep, it, your body will respond. But if you've already been doing a cardio an hour a day every day for the last six weeks. And me as a coach telling you to do an extra how, half hour, hour, or ramping it up, anything. it ain't going to do much. Your body is already kind of pushing back at you. But if you haven't done hardly any and you've manipulated your body fat percentage all through training intensity, volume, and then nutrition, then when I tell you to kick up that cardio, you'll drop. And that's, to me, that's the, that's the place you want to be. So try and lean out slowly through nutrition and training and, and, and not so much with a bunch of cardio right now. We want to save that in our back pocket if we can. Gosh, appreciate it, man. All right, you got it. Thanks All for right, calling Karen. in. I no problem. You know what's interesting? Do you agree, Justin? I mean, is that what you? <laughs> <laughs> what exactly? I would have told him. <laughs> you know what's My interesting show. is uh, obviously I never competed, never got on stage, but uh, you know I've done I've a few times tried to get really, really lean and, and measured um, on a weekly basis my progress, mm-hmm. and that's the exact number that I came to was that uh, a half a percent half to a percent. To a percent. Mm-hmm. If I was doing everything right. I would average about a half a percent to a percent. And anytime I tried to push more than a percent, it would backfire. Yep. So, and so I was exact same. So when you're saying those numbers, I'm like, man, that's exactly what I came to myself. I, and I love planning that you're only going to get a half a percent off a week because I know I can move some other needles to yeah. get a percent. Yeah. And I, I want it. So I want to plan for that, knowing that if I, if I, if I don't like the way I'm shaping up, mm-hmm. Heading into the last few weeks, I can I can kick up those things to get get an extra half. Percent What's out. interesting about that process, if, if, if you know someone listening has never done that, is the leaner you get because uh, the the steps you take start to compile, and what happens with this is as you get leaner, messing up a little bit becomes a bigger impact than it did in the beginning. Like you get down to like four percent body fat, and like you get get off track just a little bit, boom, up to four and a half, five percent right away. When you're ten percent, doesn't make that big of a difference. So I remember that whole process. I, you know, like I said, I've done it a couple times, and the body's interesting if you really, you know, pay attention. It, to there, it. You know, there's, there's. A, I was trying to think of an analogy I wanted to give, and for some weird reason, uh, I was thinking of like things that have been said to me by a tattoo artist. Right? There's an art to this, and you, if you've ever had like an unfinished piece of tattoo or something like that, and you try to get another artist to do it, they will refuse to do it because they're just like, I can't. It's mm-hmm. like, come on, you're an artist. You could do, can't you? Yeah. No, I don't. Yeah. I don't want to touch it. Somebody, I won't do it because it's it's not from scratch. It's not yeah. a blank canvas. Somebody else's foundation. That's how I feel when I get people like this. They would call me or they like, reach. Fix this. Yeah, help me out. I know my coach isn't doing me right. My body's not responding. I'm 11 weeks out from this, and I'm like, <laughs> I, I I can't because like you're a wizard. Well, it's like it, because what they have to understand is that to me, I think the most important part of prep is done in the off season. Yes. How well you built your metabolism yep. up, how like where you have scaled your your volume and intensity of training. And if you did a really good job of training moderately, both uh frequency, intensity, volume wise, and you've got a healthy metabolism, if you got all those levers to move with yep. going into a prep and you've kept your body fat percentage within about a half a percent to a percent, uh, you know, knowing the weeks going into the stage, you're in a very good place. I've got volume to manipulate. I got intensity to manipulate. I've got frequency I can manipulate. I've also got cardio I can manipulate. And I've got a healthy metabolism that I have a lot of calories that I can cut down and still be in a healthy place. To me, all that is done in the off season, preparing the body to have a, a, a successful prep. And if I get you mid prep and you're like, fix me, it's like, no, nah, it doesn't work that way. Our next caller is Brianne from Canada. Brianne, what's happening? How can we help you? Hi. Um, thanks guys so much for taking my question. I've been listening for a long time, but I'll just dive right into it. Um, so overall, I think I'm pretty strong. Um, my question really is how I can progress my bench press and I'll put a little context to it. So I've been able to progress my deadlift to 295 pounds, my squat Ooh. to 275 pounds, Ooh. my overhead press to 125 pounds. Wow. But yet I really can't progress my bench press. I'm stuck at 125 pounds and I've been stuck at it for a few years now. Um, I can press 95 for like full pause reps and get 12 to 15 reps in. But as soon as I start to add weight, I really struggle. 
um, when it comes down to my one RM. I can press like my reps increasing, but I can't get my one RM to increase. Now, my competitive nature in me is that I want to join a powerlifting competition, but I don't want to do that till I can bench my body weight, which is 145 pounds. Um, I've done powerlifting programs through coaches. I've done five by five training. I've programmed myself. I've done strength programs. I've done so many different things. And I'm starting to think it might just be a mental block. And I'm looking for you guys for advice on how I can improve my bench press. Wow. You're not, you're not allowed to. You're too good at everything else. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. You can't have everything. Yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll say this first, Brianne. I think you should compete before you yes. hit that just yes. to go through the competition and yeah. there's a lot that goes into it and the day of the right. competition that you'll learn. And I think you'll do better than you think. Yeah. Um, uh, just with the, the adrenaline, and everything yeah. else is going to kind of set in. So to, so to get this straight, your overhead press and your bench press are the same. Yeah, pretty okay. much. Interesting. Yeah. And have you worked with, um, with bands and chains? Have you done, yeah. have you tried working with resistance that's progressive? Okay. Yes. Yeah bands at home and then i also have some change at my own home gym too and i like to change it up a little bit um i have um, a swiss bar at my home gym as well and then i also have a commercial gym that i have access to which has a little bit less equipment than my home gym does okay what uh do you where do you feel a sticking point at any part in your bench press yeah definitely my lats oh mm. so what do you mean you feel like you're not stable um, no, when I'm at the lowest part of it. So if I have like a pause drop, for example, it's definitely my lats that I feel the most engaged. Okay. Um, so the bar gets stuck at the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. When it's my one RM, but I can progress lots of reps <laughs> at like 115 pounds or even 105 pounds. Just, I can't get 130 pounds up. Heavy dips. Yeah. I was going to say really deep. Yeah. Uh, dips. Have you focused on that at all? Uh, and yeah, and adding weight to that. So you're just doing less reps and more just like intense, you know, added uh, weight on top of your body weight kind of dips. Um, Not super deep ones. I've never done them with weight. I can only get like five or six body weight form dips at this point. Okay. Yeah, I would go, I would slow down the rep and try and challenge the form with good technique. Don't hurt your shoulders and try and get more depth. And rather than doing five reps, make it so that you only do two. Or one, even. Uh, or one with the dips. Um, and practice them frequently. The other thing, too, is taking volume away from other lifts and adding it to the bench press. Mm -hmm. Sometimes yeah. a mistake people make when they have a lift Just that focus they're... focus on it more. Yeah, where they're stuck at, is they'll add stuff to that lift, but they don't take anything else away or anything away from the other lifts. So what ends up happening is their overall volume just keeps going up and up and up. So like yeah. uh, one of the best things I ever did to increase my overhead press was reduce my volume from other lifts and increase and then add it to my overhead press type lifts and I got much stronger. The other thing is isometrics. Mm -hmm. uh, isometrics can be phenomenal. One of the best types of isometrics for, uh, or isometric type lifts for power lifters is to get under a bar. So here's what you do. I don't know if you've done this already. You set the safeties so that the bar is already as if it's on your chest. Then you mm -hmm. shimmy yourself under the bar get into position, get real tight, and then press off the safeties and then bring it down. So you practice doing singles or doubles from that position right there. Now, don't go to failure, but you want to have kind of a moderate high intensity. So something that you could do maybe four reps with, I would do a bunch of singles and doubles with it. So I also like doing like a isometric hold at the bottom of a deep dip with a weight you can't even do one. So loading, like let's oh, say like a 25 pound kettlebell on, yeah. on it and getting in the dip position and it's totally really slow negative to get into. Yes. It too. And then slowly yeah. come down and you can't even press it out. I don't care. Well, but make I want sure you, you have something to step on. After well, yeah, that. you yeah, have yeah. something to step yeah, on right there. You don't, yeah, obviously don't do it suspended five feet off the ground, <laughs> yeah. you know, where you're going to rip your shoulders off. So have like a, 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 bo a box underneath there that all you have to do is put your feet down, right? So you have to bend your knees to do it, right? I like so that a lot. Can get all the way to the top with a weight you can't even do one time. So just a little bit over that and then just resist the negative all the way down at the bottom and then hold an isometric hold at the bottom for a few like five seconds and mm -hmm. then go ahead and put your feet back down and then rest do that again a few times yeah. i think that was your too. leg drive um pretty good i try to keep an arch to it but i'll also practice uh more of like a flat bench to it too hmm. but i can like i use a lot more of my leg purposefully as soon as i start to increase the weight a bit more mm -hmm. but practice just like back complete flat no leg drive bench press too like i typically bench about twice a week okay yeah you know i would make one of the bench press sessions uh what i said literally set the safeties at the bottom yeah. position 
scoot underneath it. This is after you warm up and do your mobility and stuff. And then you press mm-hmm. off the safeties. So you don't get the you don't get the the benefit of lowering the weight and pressing up. You start at the bottom, press it up, and then bring it down. Let it sit on the safeties where you're actually kind of like relaxed. Get back into position, get real tight, and then do it again. That's yeah. the most effective thing I've ever done for getting my bottom position squats and my bottom position presses to get stronger. Like nothing moved the needle more for me than that. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I have like squats and you do uh, zercher pr- uh, squats and that's basically the same thing, but take the bench element to it. So no, that's actually a really good idea. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And I was thinking too, like some more advanced kind of things you can play around with, like some paps where we do some explosive, like medicine ball chest, pass or we do like some uh, pu- explosive push-ups and then you know bring it over to the bench so you just ramp up the ability to produce force uh, at a greater capacity is just to kind of try that which out. would only be like one to three reps right yeah. that's all you're doing one to yeah. three reps of that explosive and then you go over but there th- something to consider too you work in the space do you work in the fitness space i do yes i'm a phys ed teacher i was a former trainer i've been in health uh, space for over 10 years now okay wonderful all right so you'll you'll get this then you know yeah. that there's a skill component to new movements that you have to learn yeah. before you can really start to ramp up intensity and strength, okay? Mm-hmm. So the, the the exercise that I gave you, the bench press modification that I gave you, yeah. of all the advice that we gave you is going to require the, less, the least amount of skill acquisition because it's still a bench press. It's different, mm-hmm. so you're still going to take some getting used to, but doing different exercises... It, there's going to be a period of time where you have to learn and kind of get into it and figure it out and, and that whole process. Right now, literally, your next bench press workout, if the whole session is you getting under the bar to where it's set at the bottom and you just get tight and learn how to press from a dead position, that's not going to require as much skill acquisition because you already know how to bench press. The carryover is yeah. pretty direct because it's still a bench press. And I bet you practicing that alone, you'll probably see a gain within a couple weeks. Okay. That'd be awesome because I've been stuck at this weight for years. It's been. Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. do. I do want to highlight and point out though, you're very fucking strong. Okay. Yeah. Thank so you. and you have been doing yeah. this for a long time. So there yeah. is there is a point too. I mean, I, I would love to have a 500 pound squat, and I don't. You know, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I tend to I tend to peak out around 400, no matter how much I've been training and and trying to do every technique I can to get a little bit more. But well, what's the cool part about powerlifting? It's like never really balanced. You know, between all three of them. Yeah, you're not really awesome at all of them. There's always gonna be that one that's just kind of a difficult one. So. And totally. and she's really awesome at deadlifting and squatting. Yeah. That's that's good. That's good ass yeah. weight right well, her there. Overhead Press is yeah, and you're over yeah. press. Yeah. Not yeah, and the guy is about my bench. I'm like, I, it should be stronger. I should be able to. Yeah, yeah. Don't get caught should. up in that. I should. That's a game. Never play that game with yeah. with uh, with your performance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know it's yeah. tough though. <laughs> Listen, don't do that because I'll go through Instagram and then there's these like female powerlifters <laughs> just <laughs> just bury me. You know, oh, I should be able to lift more. I've been working off. Don't do that game. That'll right. get you hurt. Yeah. Right. Do you have do you have our uh, powerlifting program? I don't know. Okay, let's have Doug send that over since yeah. it's the best one on the internet. So yeah, we're also going to send you. Um, I want to send you Maps Prime Pro if you don't have that. With your background, I think you'll get a lot of value out of it. Okay, awesome. Thank you guys so much. Mm-hmm. You got it. Thanks yeah. for calling in. Good so, luck, huh? Yeah. Thank you so much. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully I can get it. <laughs> you got it. You know what, just what you said, Justin, about how there's always I don't know what word you use. There's a bit of an imbalance between the lifts for yeah. people. That's because leverages that work well for some lifts yeah. make you make it harder for others. For that's example, a, that's why I'm a great deadlifter yep. and a terrible squatter. It's, yeah. It's or avid. a great deadlifter and a bad bencher, right? Because if you have yep. a great deadlifter has long arms, yeah. a bad bench presser has long arms, right? A great bench presser has short arms. Mm-hmm. A bad deadlifter has short arms. Well, that, and that's the point I'm trying to make to yeah. her because if she's deadlifting almost 300 pounds and she's not like a th- big old thick girl, she's lean and thin. Like that's yeah. a, that's good ass weight right there, which is probably why she really struggles with the bench press. Yeah. I mean, the, the the thought that, which is, this is totally me. I can yeah. I can deadlift 550 pounds, but benching over 315 is, is a struggle. The typical though. athlete. I mean, this is a deficit that she's like, ah, I got to hone in on this and like master it. And, you know, it's just like, it, that's all part of the challenge of the sport. So. Yeah, I will say this though. Uh, of all the, of all those lifts that she listed and the one that wasn't a, a technical, you know, technically a power lift and overhead press, the bench press is actually the least functional. I know. So if you're going to be strong, better to be yeah, good at the yeah, overhead press. True. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yep. Our next caller is Lyle from Michigan. Lyle, what's happening? How can we help you? Oh, not much. How about you guys? Good. Good. How much? Yeah. So, um, 
I guess, yeah, my uh, question for you guys is uh, just about your MAPS Prime Pro program. I'm trying to focus on some mobility going on with my shoulder. And um, just kind of curious on, I know the shoulder's kind of a complicated uh, joint. And just how do you know which of the exercises are best to do? Good question. Yeah. Okay. So when you look through Prime Pro and you find the joint that you want to work on, I suggest you simply pick one or two and you practice them and see how you feel and if you notice an immediate difference. And through that process, when you find one that seems to feel pretty good, stick to that one for a while until it becomes like second nature and then move on. It's really hard to determine which one is going to affect you the best right out the gates without actually trying it out the first time through. So we give you a whole bunch of different movements that you can choose from. And that's going to meet that's that gives you the opportunity to kind of move through them and see, cause that's what I would do as a trainer anyway. I mean, I'd have a little bit more insight if I could watch you move and stuff like that. Um, but I still, even with clients, I would have like three or four exercises that I think would work with them. Yeah. Then we would go through them and then I'd ask them how they feel and that would help me narrow it down. That, yeah. That being said, I have some favorites to you, Justin. I do. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to hear I want to hear. Well, I, I mean, just in terms of one that kind of covers the entire function of the shoulder, which would be like the handcuffs rotation. Um, that's just one that if you can slow, very slowly take your, um, your arms and through that that range of motion and all those different rotations, even with the wrists and the elbows and um, the extension, um, to be able to to get through that entire bit, like you'll be able to, it'll be very revealing. Let's put it that way, um, to see where those sticking points lie, um, and then also to just just our basic, our most basic one in terms of uh, our wall press. Uh, just this is one that that plagues everybody in terms of like, we just are always so forward in our position and our posture uh, at work and just everyday activities to, to have that external rotation is something we lose. Uh, so that, that itself to, to not be able to kind of press your, your elbows and your wrists back to the wall uh, would be a clear indication that that's something that you're going to need to work on. Yeah. That's the, the zone. One. And if you haven't watched the one where Justin, that's the, uh, the prime webinar that Justin did where he takes you through that. I also do it in the prime pro webinar too. Right. So yep. I do it in there. I agree with Justin. Sal's right. Like, I, of course I'm going to ask my client feedback and, you know, some clients, they feel a certain mobility drill and it just seems to be more effective than for somebody else. But personally, if I had to choose one shoulder exercise or one mobility drill for the shoulder that I have, it's handcuffed with rotation for that simple fact that, you, it takes the shoulder through it, the entire full range of motion. I just don't, I, the, the, as far as all the mobility drills that are in there, I think that's the one that kind of encompasses every everything. And so if you can perform that one, I think that you're going to address most potential issues. If that one feels uh, too challenging or you get a lot of sticking points, you can also do wall circles is where I would, uh, mm -hmm. I would move down from. That's the one. It's that a good I'm regression. Missing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've seen that because I, I haven't seen the Prime webinar, but I've seen the Prime Pro one. And um, yeah, I did. I've started doing those handcuffs with rotations and they felt really good. And but yeah, I mean, my like my uh, also kind of just sort of curious about what to sort of like expect, how long this, you know, process should sort of take. And um, I guess, I don't know, for like clarification, my um, I'm dealing with a little bit of forward shoulder, my left, but a lot in my right. I, um, <clears throat> I do a lot of like work with my right hand Painter. more, more commonly. And hence it kind of just sort of went forward. So the biggest thing I'm trying to get is to mm -hmm. pull, almost try to get my shoulder blade back kind of where it was supposed to be and working in those, in those full ranges of motion. And, uh, here's what you'll notice when you, when you pick the right movement you should feel a little bit better right afterwards. In other words, if you have a little bit of pain, you shouldn't feel more pain after. You should feel like, oh, it feels a little bit better. That's a good indicator. You might get mm -hmm. a little sore later on. And then over time, over the course of a week or two weeks or three weeks, you should notice the exercise, the movements getting easier. And then other exercises or movements that used to bother your shoulder don't bother it as much. Okay, so basically you should see positive trends from the gate. You should not see negative trends at all.
Lyle, do you uh, is uh, Prime Pro the only program that you have? Do you have any of our other programs as far as exercise? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I do have, uh, I also have prime and then I have performance anabolic and symmetry. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm going to, so are you a painter? Is that what you do? Do you paint? Is that what you do? Um, well I do, I do paint. Um, so I kind of work, do a few different things. Um, I do, I run a CNC machine for like wood cut out parts for cabinetry. And then I also assemble and paint those cabinets so yeah based on your shirt i was gonna guess either drywall or birds yeah <laughs> or birds <laughs> big birds yeah big birds so here, here's the deal because your your question was like you know how long th this may be something that you do indefinitely because of your profession because of the years of because be just, like this isn't like one of these deals where oh if i do these mobility exercises i'm gonna fix my problem yeah. and i know i no longer have to do it anymore yeah. because if you have a job where you're painting, you're cutting, and you're rotating that shoulder forward because that's you have to in order to perform your job, and you're doing that for six, eight hours a day every day, you got to do something in the gym to consistently combat that so that doesn't get progressively worse. So it may become a, a staple thing that you just kind of always do before you exercise as you do these little prime movements before you go into your workout. I am going to give you two other exercises that I think should become staple movements in your training based off of what I think you do for a professional will help you, which is a seated row. And then I also like a, a Z press. And those, those two movements, I think, will help with you t t keeping your shoulder girdle in a kind of a retracted and depressed position, which I think might be part of why you're feeling an issue on the shoulder on that one side. So if, if, even if you're not following a MAPS program, I would include seated rows and I would include Z presses in my training on top of those mobility moves. That would be like staple movements that I do on a very regular basis for you. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, and I guess that also kind of leads me to like a uh, like different question, sort of, if there's enough time. The um, I was just curious about, as I'm going through this, you know, Prime Pro talks about doing it kind of throughout the day. What should I try to be doing, like focusing on in terms of like the gym? Because I do typically follow you guys for um, your programs. Um, they're awesome. And um, I've noticed a lot of good results, but I'm also kind of curious on like, what would be a good route to go down? Any, like, any kind of compliment. You're Lyle. Any of the programs would be appropriate so long as you're doing the, the prime pro stuff throughout the day. But I will say this in prime, there's a zone one fortification workout. Okay. I think that'll benefit you. I think that's what you should do for your upper body for a little while. And that workout is designed to correct imbalances in the upper body, which includes the shoulder. And there's a seated row in that. There, yeah. So I would go zone one fortification workout from MAPS Prime. Do that for your upper body. Yeah. Create that strength stability there around the shoulder so you feel like you can then add adequate load uh, when you get back to working out uh, at an intense yeah. rate. Descri then, describe to me, too. We haven't even asked you this. Yeah. Like where, is it, where, where, where is the pain? Yeah. When does it come up? Is it consistent throughout the day? Does it just flare up every once in a while? Where do you feel it? What's going on? Um, well, I don't really notice any pain, but I just noticed for the past couple, or past few years that um, as time goes on, my, my shoulder just kind of leans a little bit forward. And what kind of brought this on was a uh, um, massage, massage therapist was working on me. I'd gotten a, you know, like a, a full body massage hour and a half. And then that entire hour and a half ended up being just on that shoulder. Um, I don't notice any pain from it, but I don't want there to be pain down the road. And then that kind of le led me down to watching the Prime Pro uh, webinar and yeah. getting the program and Good. I just well, that's want to try to. That's good. Yeah, bro. The issues before they happen. Yeah. Okay. Cool. That that's a different story now. That that's a, you're in a good position then. The fact that we're addressing this before it becomes something like chronic pain in your shoulder. I think including the the fortification session that Sal's talking about. So including that once a week into your training, and then like I said, keep seated rows and any Z, of the, any Z of the presses. Any of our programs will be appropriate. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. On top of that. Yep. You just you, you understand what's happening, right? So you you're you're doing a job where your shoulder is rolling forward all the time. And so the exercises you want to just always include in there is the opposite, is retracting and depressing down. 
So you just want to you want to keep that kind of movement in a, on a weekly basis in your training routine to combat all of this all this work all day long. Yeah. So I think the opposite. The opposite is a a seated row, right? Like where you retract the shoulder and and pull down to where I I'm yeah, zone one fortification is, gonna, is there is all that. Yeah. Keep just yeah. keep that in there, and you know throughout the day you could have bands. This would be great if you had some like bands you could wrap around and just do some rows. So like every like you know every hour or two hours or like that or whenever you yeah, get a little do bit like of a, a break. couple minutes yeah do do some some band and you're not it's trying to get like a crazy yeah band pull apart so band pull aparts and some rows every couple hours and you're not trying to get a hard workout you're just trying to get you're just activating yeah mm -hmm. just squeezing those shoulder blades back because what's happening is you're just rolled forward all day long and then the massage therapist knows that she she's rubbing your back and she can feel all the knots that you probably have behind your your shoulder blade. And that's probably what she was working out. And the fact that you're already prevented, trying to prevent this is uh, you're in a good position. We're yeah. not waiting until you have chronic pain. All righty. Yeah, thanks. And uh, yeah, just a big thank you to all you guys, you know, the oblig obligatory whatever thanks for all the stuff you guys put out. Yeah, I've been listening to you guys for a few years. And uh, I mean, I'm a bit of a younger guy. So it, a few years back is quite quite significant. Like when I, uh, yeah, when I first started listening to you, I was in, like just a lot different place and um just shout out to any of the younger listeners out there because if you keep listening to these guys they'll uh they'll definitely put you in a bit more of a, like a mature mental space i feel like oh cool that thank was nice awesome. to hear thank yeah, you it's thanks a great compliment, lyle take care of those mm -hmm. birds <laughs> take it easy man <laughs> take it easy keep us all posted right, yeah thank let, you take let, care let us know how it goes man all yeah. right yeah we'll do thank you all right all right this you just made me think about the most I mean, besides injuries, right? The most imbalanced from right to left client I ever worked with was a high school pitcher mm -hmm. who threw heat. Like he uh, could hit yeah. 90 miles an hour, yeah. okay, mm -hmm. in high school. He just was working on his accuracy and he was getting scouted mm -hmm. and never worked out. All he did was play baseball and just forms into that. Bro, his, the difference between his right and left was like, it's like if you, you took two people, cut them in half, and then pasted them together. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe the imbalance between right and left. Because of the years and years and years of pitching. I mean, your body will form itself well, you, it to was, become good at what you always do. You yep. or Justin always bring up the... Is the long bowman. Yeah, the yeah. long bowman. The, yeah. the skeleton. Oh, the, fine, the, ske the skeleton yeah. will change. Yeah. 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 I mean, so... Uh, the spine is twisted and the... Feet, but here's the what feet I, I mean. Torque. It's so funny. We're over here like troubleshooting. We hadn't even asked him. Like, hey, where's the pain? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, no, he's like, I don't have any pain. We're like, yeah. oh, fuck. Awesome. Uh -huh. Good. But how? I mean, it's so, so great. I mean, that makes me so happy to hear a younger guy that's been listening to the show for years recognizes that he's... He's not just like, how do I get stronger and bigger? Right, you right. Know? And he mm -hmm. recognizes there's something off there. He's got enough yeah. to wear him. And, and what a great, like, just notices the massage therapist is on there for an hour because he's got knots in there. But he doesn't have any chronic pain or anything yep. bad yet, yep. but wants to know what I need to do. And just, you know, this is what makes me, uh, why when I, I get frustrated with our, our space that tries to clown on the, you know, mobility stuff and that conversation around that, because there's a classic example of like, well, he necessarily doesn't need it. He's not, yeah. nothing's hurting. There's no pain. So right. why it's like, why address it? It's yeah. like, well, I mean, dude, dude, if this dude addresses this right now, he may prevent having any sort of right. shoulder issues or a, a, an injury that could end up happening right. five, 10 years down the road. That's right. Look, if you like mind pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free stuff. We got free guides that can help you with any health or fitness goal, almost any, you can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump DeStefano. And Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 